Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am one of your two co-hosts for today, uh, Dr. John DeLynn. It is December 6th, I believe, 2021, and I am joined by the amazing, the funny, the thoughtful, the wise, Kara Burrell. Kara Burrell. Oh, me? Thanks, John. What's up, boss? Nice to see you. I'm excited for today. I'm so excited for today and this week. You guys are going to need to buckle into your seatbelts. We are going to take you on a ride, let me tell you. So what are we talking about today, John? So today, this week, is Anthony Magna Bosco slash Street Epistemology Week. And for most of my audience, that will mean nothing. But for my really plugged in, connected audience, they're going to be super excited. Um, I don't want to spend too much time giving an intro, but we're going to be doing five consecutive days covering Street Epistemology and we had Anthony Magna Bosco here uh, in studio at Thrive a couple of weeks ago. He spoke at Thrive. We did four episodes with Anthony. And Kara, why don't you just do a super quick overview? Because the whole point of today is to show instead of tell, because we're going to be talking about street epistemology for four more episodes. So give us just the one minute, <sighs> one super minute. high level intro. Yeah. Once upon a time. <laughs> thankfully, I think Mormon Stories listeners are very intelligent people. If you are here, then you don't need a lot of explanation. And we are going to show and not tell kind of what street epistemology is because it's better to watch it be done than try to have an intellectual conversation to try to break it down. So a uh, quick overview. Street epistemology um, was developed by Peter Bogosian, but it's just about um, investigating truth claims and seeing if people have good reasons to believe the things that they believe. And it's done in a very cordial, friendly manner. And Anthony Magnabosco has a fantastic YouTube channel that we have his link and uh, the link tree for Anthony and Street Epistemology will be in the show notes below um, if you want to check out more of his channel. So I thought the best way to introduce Ma Anthony Magnabosco Week, Street Epistemology Week, is just to show two of his m most popular clips from his YouTube channel, Talking with Mormons on the Street. He just stands out this one the first one is going to be at a university the second one's going to be um on a hiking trail where he has all kinds of people walk by and he just asks them if they want to take a claim and and go through the reasons that they um believe the things that they believe and he has like gopros on him and he edits them together and they're really popular so the first one is him talking at a university with a couple missionaries and so we're just gonna play the clip so you won't hear a peep out of us and i have confidence that the mormon stories listeners will kind of just pick up the technique um his interview style and a little bit about street epistemology and he develops it other people develop it there's lots of other great youtube channels that do the same thing and so no technique is perfect, but I think that you'll kind of uh, glean some interesting insights from how to have non-confrontational conversations with people who have differing beliefs. So I, love it. I think that's about it. Now I'll add 20 seconds. Just uh, it, for those of you who don't know, Anthony has double the subscribers on YouTube that Mormon Stories does. He really is kind of an international legend. And like you say, he's developed this method of talking to people about their beliefs that just, it's not, the goal is not to take people's beliefs away from them. It's not to challenge their beliefs. It's just to have them uh, learn more about why they believe what they believe. And it's, it can be a really effective method. We think an effective tool to help you as progressive and post-Mormons talk to believing family and friends. And so what you're going to hear today uh, and over the next five days, uh, today we're going to just introduce street epistemology to you with Anthony talking to two different sets of Mormons. Uh, like you said, a missionary couple and then a married couple. And that will that will be the showing of you of what street epistemology is in a Mormon context. Day two is going to be us getting Anthony's story of how he developed street epistemology and why, and a little bit about his background. Mm -hmm. Day three is going to be uh, us kind of doing uh, an introduction or an overview of what a street epistemology is with Anthony. Day four is going to be I think I'm most excited about this. We Wait. got you know, what? I told you guys to buckle your seatbelts because we we didn't have the time to go and <laughs> shove Anthony out on the street to go do this in Utah. We wish we could have. So we did the next best thing is we <laughs> had the very noble and courageous Sean McCraney <laughs> come in and talk about his beliefs. He's a Christian pastor here in Salt Lake. And we had Anthony kind of do his interview technique with uh, Sean with some very interesting results so that's part four part Continue. four yeah we Sean it's McCraney. incredible it is 
I, I, Anthony Ma- Magnabosco literally doing street epistemology with a Christian, ex Mormon Christian pastor, Sean McCraney. It's amazing. And then day five is going to be Kara and I being the role model of believing Mormon parents. Anthony- is your seatbelt tight enough? <laughs> <laughs> we spend about an hour in character as Mormon parents, and we have Anthony kind of role play using a street epistemology technique because street epistemology kind of has the word street in it. It's usually done with strangers. So when you do it with somebody that's close to you, that's a loved one, it's a little bit different. So you'll see the way that he applies the technique as if he were coming out as somebody who maybe lost their faith to like believing Mormon parents and me and John play those Mormon parents. So it's insightful. It's funny. I forget the name of the prophet. (laughs) It's all the things you're going to love it. Yeah, it's going to be great. So it's going to be a great week. We hope you love street epistemology. And with the, and oh, and if you're just listening, that's totally fine. Know that when when Anthony does, as you said, when he does street epistemology, he does it with GoPros with multiple camera angles. And so you will probably get the full effect from this series if you watch it. But I think the way you've edited it, there, there will still be a lot of value. You'll still get 99% of the value by listening. Yeah, I think you'll get 99% of the value. You might miss a few words here and there. He has microphones on his GoPros and things. And so I took, with his permission, some of his YouTube videos. They're pretty long. They're usually about an hour long, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And so I cut out a little bit of it so it's a little bit more condensed than the ones that you'll find on his YouTube channel. But we're just going to go ahead and play um, two of these interviews. They're about 30 minutes each. So this first one is Anthony meeting a couple Mormon missionaries. Is that right? Right. All right, everyone. Uh, here is the first clip of Street Epistemology with Anthony Magnabosco in a Mormon context. Hope you enjoy it and feel free to comment here on the live stream if you're joining us live. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Let's go. Oh, hey, gentlemen. How are you? Okay, what's going on? Christ. Is that what that one is? I saw this up on the thing. Somebody posted a, a thing of Jesus over here. Did you see it? Heck yeah, that's one of our pictures. Is that one of yours? Yeah. I don't know why there's a picture of a girl here. Yeah, I don't know about that one either. Yeah. You kind of threw that on there. Okay. Add it to it. I don't know if you guys stuck that up there or somebody else did. Yeah. Huh. You want one? Not really. Okay. No. <laughs> Would you guys be interested in doing an interview about your faith and why you actually think that it's true? Sure. Okay. Why not? What, what does it entail? It entails asking respectful yet challenging questions about how you arrived at your conclusions. Hmm. And let me just caveat it here. Yeah. This isn't to trick you or yeah. be a got you or to make you look stupid. But it's to like interview like genuine people like out there. Yep. Now, I usually talk to people about all sorts of claims. However, it's quite obvious that your claim, I think, would be that that your God is real. Yeah. We can even talk about a completely different claim if you want. We can set aside the claim that God is real and talk about something else. The idea here with what I'm doing is to take your claim and respectfully explore it with you by listening, by figuring out what your best argument is for your position, and yet gently challenging how you got there. Okay. Do you want to give it a go? And here's the other thing too. You have yeah. full control over this. Okay. In fact, if you want, I could even put some blue tape over your name tags so your names aren't even apparent. I can even blur your face. Or at the very least, at the end of the conversation, if you are worried about it, you okay. can message, I'll give you an email, and you can say, don't use you know, don't use the footage or blur our faces or whatever. Okay. The idea here, like I said, is not to embarrass you. Yeah. It's to be a, a helpful aid in your reflection on how you arrived at your conclusion. Okay. Yeah. And what is, what is this for exactly? I'm doing street epistemology. Have you heard of it yet? No. You haven't? Okay. Yeah. Well, take these for, for one thing. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Street epistemology is a conversational technique that you can use with anybody when they make a claim. Okay. In fact, there was just a guy that walked by here who says he's been watching my videos okay. and it's helping him engage with his father on politics. Hmm. So instead of arguing, debating, huh. he uses questions with his dad now and they've had much better dialogues because he's adopted this approach. Very fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you seem hesitant. You seem like you're ready to go. That's kind of the sense that I'm getting. And that's. I only fear not that I'd be wrong, but I'd be saying the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. I do that a lot. Could there be value in saying something incorrect and discovering later that there's maybe a better way of phrasing it or a better argument for the view? Absolutely. Yeah. How could you discover that you actually have a better argument for your position if you don't currently surface the ones that you have? 
Fair point. Absolutely. I want to help you figure out what your best argument is for your view that LDS Church has the truth. Okay. And I want to try to approach it from a very neutral position, even though I, I may be a Mormon, I may not be a Mormon. I can even disclose to you where I stand in your claim before we even go, if you want to do that, at the risk of possibly making you more defensive. And if you're okay with that, I'd like to move here so I can actually get you guys on camera too. Yeah. But that, there's there's no pressure either way. Okay. Is this like a YouTube video? Is that what it is? Yep. Okay. Ideally, yeah. I appreciate you stopping. You guys are okay with me recording this Absolutely. so far, yeah. at least? Okay. Please. My first name is Anthony, by the Anthony, way. Anthony, pleasure to meet you. I'm Elder Okay. I'm Elder Okay. Those are your last names? Yeah. Yep. Uh, how do you feel about me? Do you want me to beep those out? Would you rather... Are you okay with your name no, showing? No. I mean, we, we represent Jesus Christ. Okay. We do our best, too. So. Awesome. I appreciate your honesty and your willingness to share you know, share your reasons for thinking that it's true and yeah. also maybe your methods for confirming the reasons. Okay. Yeah, cool. And I don't like to keep people for too long either. I usually set a timer to keep it really brief. Okay. How and long are you me expecting? I usually set it for four minutes. However, with two people, it's almost impossible. Okay. So maybe I can maybe do it in maybe seven minutes or eight minutes. Okay. Yeah, we can, we can try. Can you spare first. that? Yeah. How's it going, brother? Well, I'm also not setting a timer to rush you. Okay. No. I'm setting it to just respect your time. Okay. I mean, this just a little bit. So it can get both of us, all of us. Okay. I sometimes don't know where people gonna are gonna stand until they actually stand. Well, you just you place us where you. I think that's gonna be okay. I think the sun probably won't be hitting that too much. Okay. Well, let's start with this. What brings you to the campus? Uh, are you members of you guys go to the school here or anything no. like that? Okay, I don't I don't go here either. But we're allowed to be here. Yeah. We're allowed to be here to engage with the students, Absolutely. and I think we're going about it in different ways. Of course. Yeah. Uh, if I could give my view on it. I think you're probably going around telling people what they should think, maybe? Are you um, are, are you doing that? Whereas whereas I'm asking people why they think things. Okay, absolutely. It, I don't want to put words in your mouth, though. That's no, not... We're, right. perfect. We're here sharing what we believe and just helping people come to their own conclusions. And we're inviting them to try things out that we found works in our lives, Yeah. such as praying and reading scriptures and really just trying to find who, what they believe. Okay. You're out here asking people what they believe is that right essentially yes. okay is one of your goals to have them believe what you believe absolutely okay i think so i, I appreciate your honesty of course yeah i suppose if i thought that i had the truth of the matter when it comes to a god existing then i would be out here doing exactly what you're doing yeah absolutely the important thing to note though is that the things that we share with people you never expect them to just take our word for it that's the last thing we want people to do hmm. We believe that this should be a very personal conviction, very personal witness that you have okay. from this experience. And so what we do as missionaries is we teach brief lessons, sometimes just 10 minutes long. And that's what we do a lot on campus, just little quick lessons. Do you do them right here on the street or do you invite people to come to like an after an after school thing? Or? Either or. I mean, we have meetings on Wednesdays and of course Sunday mm -hmm. service. Hmm. But we like people to meet people on campus. Just to help them out in the middle of the day, we believe that Jesus Christ helps people in all aspects of their lives. Okay. Not just spiritually, but also academically. And okay. So if we can bless anybody's life through a quick 10 minute lesson, then mm. that's our goal. Did it take more than 10 minutes for you to come to accept it as truth? Or was there some other was there some other path that you each took? It's a little bit tougher when I'm talking yeah. to two because oh, maybe yeah, you guys yeah. arrived at this conclusion differently. No, of course. We both arrived at it a different way. We were both raised in the church. Um, mm. I personally just. I didn't really have like my own belief of it for a while. It was... Even though you were raised in it? There's there's a point where I, I questioned it myself. I had to get my own answer. I couldn't just rely off what my parents told me the entire time. Beautiful. And so that's when I really did my own research. I delved into it. I looked at both sides of the argument. Hmm. You actually had some questions about it and you decided to research it. And then if I understand right, the research concluded when you found sufficient answers to think that it's true? Yeah. Okay. What was your, why are you out here actually, you must think that it's true to some extent. How did you actually get to your position? It would be very true. Um, mm -hmm. I was born in the church like he was, mm -hmm. but I fell away in high school. I think that was just the result of being born in the church. and you Fell away in high school. Yeah. What is, can you define what that means? Fell away as in no longer living the standards of the gospel. Okay. Is that equivalent to questioning or is it different? Um, I think it'd be questioning because I was questioning whether or not it was true by the action. If I knew it was true, hmm. then I probably would have followed the teachings of the church, right? I see. So you must have been questioning at that moment as well. Yeah, I I believe that. Don't let me put words in your mouth. No, that's no, not the case. No, no, that's okay. 
I believe that I knew that Jesus Christ was real and that God was real. Mm-hmm. But the fact that they knew me personally, I don't know if I knew that. I, I believe that they're more of an ex- uh, abstraction at that point. What do you say they? God and Heavenly Father. God and Heavenly sorry, Father. Sorry, I meant that. Sometimes I don't speak your yeah, lingo, so you, you might have to translate a little bit for me. I said that wrong. Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. Okay. Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. It sounds like research brought you out of your questioning phase. What brought you out of that questioning phase? Uh, testing it. Testing it? We have a belief called the Word of Wisdom of our church. Right. You mentioned that you had the ability to test the claim that these gods are real, that there's Jesus and there's, did you say the Holy Spirit? Yeah, oh, so essentially. Mm-hmm. And I did that through what they call the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom. Yeah. Was there a testing component for you as well, oh, yeah. or yeah. was it strictly research? It was research and, and testing. Mm-hmm. Okay. This could be a back and forth too, by the way. If you want to ask me questions, this isn't just like a one-way di- one directed thing. Can you tell me a little bit about the testing methodology that you use to get to your conclusion that this is true? Of course. So the word of wisdom essentially is don't drink coffee or tea. We don't smoke. We don't drink. We don't use illegal drugs. Mm -hmm. And these are dictates though, right? Like are these, I'm sorry, did you want to finish? These are commandments, yeah. Is this how you went about testing to see if it was true? Yeah, I just, I went cold turkey on all of those. Hmm. Cold turkey. Cold turkey. Okay. Because there's promises with the word of wisdom that if you do these things, if you don't drink coffee, if you don't drink tea, if you don't do, if you don't smoke or do illegal drugs, that you'll find your body to be in a healthier condition, your mind to be more alert, and all mm. these things, all these benefits that God can give you in your life. Mm. Was this how you went about testing it as well? Or was I it- went through the Book of Mormon, which is what we usually help. Like This is the ultimate thing that we have people test is the Book of Mormon because it's the keystone of our religion is what we call it. Mm-hmm. Because if the Book of Mormon is true, then our religion stands. And if it's mm. not true, then our religion falls. How did you test the Book of Mormon to determine that it was actually true? So there's a lot of people who do worldly tests of because it claims to um, be a record of the people in the ancient Americas. And so people go through, they compare the record in here to the record, like archaeological sites and stuff like that. And there, there have been similarities and stuff like that. Mm. But there's promise this is a spiritual promise so it doesn't go through the worldly sense that if you pray to know if the book of mormon's true you will really receive an answer okay there's something in the book that says i want to repeat this back so i'm yeah. not so i'm totally understanding it and yet also for you to hear what it is you're saying yeah if i understand what you're saying there's something in the book of mormon that says you can do a set of actions to get an answer that will confirm to you that the book is true yes okay and that's your test. You did that, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Did you really do it? Yeah. You did? Okay. Because yeah. uh, sometimes I meet people that I'm wondering, did they really do it? Or yeah. did they just read this that says that you can do it? And maybe they thought about doing it or they heard other people doing it. Yeah. Or maybe they sort of like, they thought about it maybe over the weekend and they, they, they just say that that was me doing it. I think that's something that I know for one. I really had to do it because this is two years of my life and I'm putting on my line and the rest of my life afterwards I'm putting on the line here. Do I really want to go mm. and spend two years of my life preaching for a church if I don't truly know it to be true myself? Okay. It just I'm, kind of seems fake and there's a lot of social pressure in the church sometimes. I but Sure. I I don't really give into social pressure. At Good all. for you. Good for you. Seriously. I'm a stubborn guy. <laughs> oh, good. I know. I, I think uh, the social pressure that can come with, uh, that, that was actually like seven or eight minutes. Okay. Can I finish my thought? And then you can ask me any question you want, or we can keep going. I would imagine that the social pressures to conform to certain beliefs can be driving a lot of a lot of the reasons why people actually think that it's true. But I'm getting the sense that that's not the reason that you're that, that you acknowledge that that's a possibility. Yeah. There's there's some people that have that social pressure, but really what we try to teach in the church is to not be socially pressured into it. Find your own mm-hmm. like, test it for yourself. Yeah. I love this idea of being able to test our beliefs to see if they match the claim. How did you determine that this was a successful test, that you actually, that the claim passed the test? I know that you each did t- different tests. Maybe we can go to you sure. because your, yeah. your friend here's been talking for a little bit, but can you take me through your testing process? Do you want to tell me a little bit more about it? How did you test it? I understand that you you decided to stop consuming specific items. Correct. 
What was it about that action that led you to think afterwards, check mark, this passes the test? You know, sometimes we sound a little bit crazy in the church because we talk about these miracles and blessings that come into our lives when doing these things. Mm. And you may think to yourself, I'm not going to drink a cup of coffee and miracles and blessings will happen in my life. And mm. I mean, whether... Strictly people, from refraining from drinking coffee. Correct, yeah. You were noticing things happening in your life to confirm to you that by not drinking coffee, and that's what the book says, this is how I can test the book to be true. You know what? That's actually not even in the Book of Mormon, the coffee part. We believe that that was a, mm. a, 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 a revelation that was given to a prophet mm-hmm. that we shouldn't do that. Okay. Uh, the amazing thing about the church and about the Book of Mormon and about the Word of Wisdom and everything that we do in the church when we test it, if we're looking for an answer, the answer we get is very specific to us. It's a very personalized spiritual answer that we believe comes uh. from God. So almost undeniable when we get the answer. Is it a personal answer to you too, or would you differ yeah. on that? There was a time that I was alone in the car, listening to music, and just that personal answer. For some reason, a thought came straight into my mind, like, it's true. Hmm. When I, was, I wasn't dwelling on the subject, I was just kind of minding my own business, doing my own thing. Yeah. And all of a sudden, that thought went straight in my mind, straight in my heart, and I felt hmm. the spirit. Hmm. Okay. I felt peace, I felt joy and happiness. Okay. Is it possible for somebody to have a personal answer like that for a confirmation that your holy book is true or a completely different holy book is true or a completely different God is real? Do you think a person can have a personal answer after embarking on a series a, a series of research and and um, testing and they it pops in their mind that it's true? Could somebody actually have that happen to them and be concluding that something is true when in reality it isn't here's here's kind of my thoughts on that is god is good right god is perfect and he leads us to do good things and so if he exists if he exists Mm -hmm. um and i'm going off the assumption that he does because i i for one know that he does hold on a second (laughs) i don't know if i could let that that go that's my knowledge is i know you started with the assumption that he's real before embarking on testing to see if he's real I, just looking at the world and everything has shown me that there is a higher power. Mm. And that's just the only conclu- logical conclusion that I can draw to. So that's the assumption I started off with, mm. is that there is a higher power. Did you start with an assumption as well? Yeah, of course. You did. And okay. that comes with just a faith or a hope that things can be better and that there's an answer to the questions I have. Last question. And then I would like you to ask me any question that you feel like you would like to ask. Okay. Why would you embark on testing if you've already assumed that it's true? One, because I didn't have the answer for myself. And two, because I wasn't happy in my life. And so Hmm. any sort of hope for happiness was something that I was sincerely looking for. I was looking in personal development books and seminars, whatever I keep my hands on. Hmm. Looking for this peace of mind of why I'm here, how can I be successful in this life? Did this belief fill that hole for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Okay, so feel free. My name's Anthony. Ask me anything that you'd like to know about my position on your claim or why I'm out here or anything along those lines. I'll try to be as open of, of a book as I possibly can. Okay. Let me just directly ask you that then. What are your thoughts on this, what we're sharing with you? I, I get a little alarmed when I hear people who say, I've started with the assumption that it's true, and then I set out to test it to see if it is. Because I'd be worried that I'd be imbuing a bias in my outcome. Okay. And to my question, too, I'd be wondering, well, why would I actually care about testing it if I've already started with the assumption that it's true? Which makes me wonder, I know this is about you asking me stuff, but yeah. you're making me wonder, do you really care if it's true or not? If it's not true, or at the very least, you discover that you don't have good reasons for thinking that it is, would you want to discover that? Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you think? Um, I didn't start off with the assumption that this specific religion is true. I started off with the assumption that God is real and I didn't know which religion Hmm. was the true one. And that's the testing that I went about and did to see if this is truly the true church. What was your assumption? I think you had said that you had also started with an assumption. Did you make a delineation between God and and the religion? I'd say, yeah, for sure. I I guess it wasn't, I believe that the religion is true. Mm -hmm. Although maybe I would have already, but 
do you think that your upbringing could have any bearing on your initial assumption that the God was real? Absolutely. I think if I grew up Hindu, I'd probably think that that God was real. Yeah. I think it's the same God, but Hmm. we all pray to the same God, essentially. If somebody was raised in India to believe that Vishnu was real, and then later they discovered a, a specific Hindu religion because they started with the assumption that that was real. Yeah. And maybe they even set out on testing it. Yeah. And they noticed things that were happening in their life to confirm that it was real. Could somebody go through all those steps and be 100% sure that it's true when in reality it isn't? The answer to that question I would give you is that the spirit of God, we believe, testifies of truth. And so the spirit can testify of what you may consider to be a universal truth or, or principles that are true. Now, whether they have the fullness of the truth, mm. I, I don't know if I would say so. But if you're doing things with the intention of best following God and you're doing your best, I believe that the, the spirit of God will testify to you that you're doing good things. He wants, he wants to bless us. That's what we believe. Does it require starting with the assumption that the God is real and being exposed to it at a, at a young age to believe that the spirit, what you call it? The spirit of God? Yeah. That, the, that Holy Ghost. the spirit of the Holy Ghost is real. Go ahead. So you're asking, Do you understand my question? I can repeat it. So you're asking if because we were raised this way, that's why we, you have to do it. Okay. Yeah, please. Sometimes I ask questions and I even confuse myself. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't want to confuse anybody here. The last thing I want is anyone to be confused. Yeah. I think you were saying yeah. that um, the way that your situation would be different is different than somebody who was raised with a belief in India and he came to believe that Vishnu was real and then gravitated to a specific religion and they start seeing all these benefits and they even see positive results to confirm their testing. The way that you're not in that category, you're different because the the spirit of the spirit of the Holy Ghost is real. So my point though is, how does a person conclude that the spirit of the Holy Ghost is real? Does that also start with the assumption that it's real, or something else? I would think so. I think it starts with the faith or hope that God is real and that He wants to bless us in our lives. I think that has to has to be within everybody who's looking for. An question. What do you think about what he said about faith and hope? Are, would you say that those are required in order to be sure that what it is you're thinking and you're out here promoting is actually true? Hmm. Trying to think about that one because like, take your time. I should have said this much earlier. I, I'm not Try gonna not, let him influence. Please me. don't. I'm, again, and, and vice versa. Yeah, <laughs> we're both pretty stubborn people. But there's some people who don't have any belief in Jesus Christ or even any sort of higher power at all, and all of a sudden they'll start recognizing things like that in their life, and so they don't initially have that faith in a higher power yet. Mm. They all of a sudden, we'll recognize something and say, "Wait, maybe that's a higher power." Could our fellow in India tell me the exact same thing? That he's noticing things happening in his life, and it's he maybe he wasn't even exposed to it. Maybe he never even started with the assumption that the God is real, or that his religion is true, or that the spirit of Vishnu is, you know, he gets that feeling in his bosom. Yeah. Um. How could we actually tell for sure that what it is you're believing is true? How can we really test it and be as unbiased and neutral on the claim as possible? That's kind of the thing is you can't really test it by worldly means. It's mm. it's all based on the person, and no amount of science or testing can ever prove one thing or another. Mm. It just stands. It's untestable? In a proving 100% certainty, worldly sense, not to the fullest extent. Are you 100% certain that the Book of Mormon is a source of truth? Yes. Did you have the ability to test it? Yeah, I've been. That's what that's what the research was. Is there's people who have done in-depth studies on like even mm. the way that the Book of Mormon speaks, the way that there's different authors in it. Mm. It's mm. all translated by one person. There's there's different scientific researches that have been done in the ancient texts, mm -hmm. the Bible, and other Hebrew texts against this. There's 
archaeological archaeological studies that have been made and that have been compared to things that have been put in the Book of Mormon about temples being built and mm. there being civilizations of millions. Mm. And yet, in order for somebody to validate that, to, to conclude that it's true, they would have to embark on the test that the book itself recommends that you do. The spiritual journey. The There's spiritual no journey. amount of secular learning can prove God. Okay. It would take the entire essence of needing faith in Jesus Christ out of it. Say that again? It would... If you could prove using, like, if you could prove 100% certainty mm -hmm. that God is real, then you no longer need to believe in him and have that faith. It, it no longer is a, a test because that's, that's something that oh. we believe is that oh. you need to be tested that there's a God. It's not the, just, hmm. you need to go through a test. Does that make sense? This is what I hear you saying. It may not be what you're saying. It almost sounds like you're saying it's more virtuous to believe that it's true without testing it and take it on faith that it is true. true. If that's test, not what you're it, saying, testing it in what sense? Testing it to the point where we can determine that it's factually true or not. Like God is factually true or like God is factually true. Or maybe that the claims in the book are factually true or that the feeling that you're getting when you abstain from drinking coffee for a significant amount of time is a good verification that it's true. It's not that it's more virtuous to go without testing. You should definitely test and try it for yourself. Mm -hmm. You should definitely know what you're talking about. I almost sense that I'm getting two messages here that, that it's not necessary to test it and that, uh, that you should be testing it. I don't know. I don't know if that's the case, but uh, let, me, let me just put it this way. Can a person be 100% sure that that book is a source of truth without any testing whatsoever? No. You, you I need think your, it you need to be like an opinion then, an uneducated opinion. It would be an uneducated, yes, this Book of Mormon, or any other holy book for that matter, possibly, yeah. would be an opinion if the person didn't have the ability to adequately test the claim. Yeah, absolutely. And you can do that with any book. You were mm. Magic Treehouse. This is the best book ever. Mm. What's inside of it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Way cool picture on the front of it, though. Mm -hmm. Great that, stories. That's why it's the Make me book. feel good when I read it. Yeah. Huh. Last question. And then please ask me questions. Yeah. Because I really do want this to be a back and forth. Okay. And I have a tendency to keep asking questions in return. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, it's fine. It's part of my nature, I suppose. Um, if you discovered that you don't have a good way to adequately test the claim, mm -hmm. meaning there's no way that I can really determine that it's true or false in this life. If you discover that you can't test it, yeah. would you lower your confidence in the claim? Very much so. I feel like if someone came up to me with a new version of the Bible and said, look at this, this is truth. I wouldn't be like, if without a way to test it for myself, I would kind of sit there like, what do you want me to do with this? How do I know if it's true? Okay. Testing is important for you in order to conclude that this is a true claim. Yes. How do you feel about that? What do you same, think? Same thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got like a million more questions for you, but <laughs> gosh, I'm so tempted to keep going. I really think we can fully explore your justifications and your methods for arriving at this conclusion if we stuck around for another 30 minutes. Um, but one of the advantages of this approach yeah. is to go at the speed that my conversation partners are comfortable with. Because oftentimes I ask questions that maybe you never heard before. Yeah. And hopefully that's the case. And hopefully, remember at the very start we were talking about, well, maybe I would say something and then I discover that maybe that's not the best reason. Maybe there, it's not the best way to explain. Yeah. I yeah. Maybe it's not the best so reason. Sometimes myself, it's like, <laughs> this is my excuse. Oh, well, wait. No, it's not exactly that. Yes. Or, I really wish I worded it differently or used a different definition of that word or whatever. That was, that's true. But there's also mm -hmm. this, which is more the reason why I did it. I feel like I used yes. to excuse my parents. It's like, this reason. It's like, <laughs> well, it's kind of that reason, but it's more this reason. It's. Yeah. So here's the way that I look at it. I kind of, I'm going to use like an American football metaphor. Like maybe we started at the zero yard line and then maybe we've advanced to like the 40 yard line here. Okay. Like I really think we've made some significant progress, but maybe you go back and maybe as you're walking away, you talk about it or you call somebody else in your organization and say, I have these really good questions and what, you know, what's the best answer? You might actually come back here and then we might actually start at the 10 yard line, you know, because you've come up with some better reasons. But I think if you keep coming back and we can keep exploring them, then we can keep advancing or mm -hmm. or uh, retreating down the field. Maybe it's not the best metaphor. I don't know. I get you. You get my point? I get what you're saying. Yeah. 
there's value in thinking about the reasons and methods that we're using it to get to our conclusions, yeah, even though we may have regretted how we explained it initially, I suppose. Wonderful. That was cool. Yeah. You want to ask me some questions? What exactly is this method that we're... There's a card. You can look all into it. I think I gave you a sticker. You. Yeah, you did. Yep. What, but what, what's exactly the method that we just used? The asking questions sort of thing? I was using questions to fully reveal your reasons for thinking that it's true mm -hmm. and your methodology for concluding that it's true. Yeah. And testing was was a very important theme here. Yeah. Like, is it really important or is it not? You know, I actually am still a little kind of hazy on it for you guys. That, that's the thing is it's a mix of mm. testing and faith is you can test it to a certain point, but you can never get that hundred percent certainty. The rest you walk by faith mm. and that's kind of the, the mix. Yeah. Gosh, I have so many questions. How also just so you know, <laughs> we have a website that talks all about this. You can look all this up on oh, it's church of Jesus Christ dot org. Yeah. I'm more interested in the beliefs that people around me are walking around yeah. with. Yeah that motivate them to come out and engage with people and, and promote their, their views to see how did you get there? Okay. You know, did, did you really use a reliable uh, process? Can I ask you one more question? Yeah. It's about faith. Okay. I think you mentioned faith and hope. I, I don't know if we actually really defined it yet, but my question to you is how big of a factor is faith in your 100%? Is it like what you need to get from a 99 to a hundred and you have all these other good testable reasons to get to the 99 or are you at a one and you need the faith to get to the hundred? Faith is the first principle of the gospel. Can you repeat that? So we believe that faith is the first principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith is the first principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yep. What does that mean exactly? I mean, it sounds important. Yeah. I, yeah. Re relating it back to my confidence scale question, of course. if you can put it in numerical terms, how influential is faith in your conclusion, your 100% conclusion, I suppose, that you have it right? Everything. It's a, faith is essential. You can't reach that 100% without faith. Like you said, do we have the 1% or the 99%? Mm -hmm. And with the Book of Mormon, I'd say I have a 70 to 80% certainty that it is true scripture. And then the other 20% mm. is where I walk by faith. Mm. Did you require faith to get to the 80%, the 70, 80%? So, again, I could probably say I had 10% faith just to test it out. And then 80% more was by the book. And mm. another 10% I walked by faith. Okay. How about for you? Was faith a factor? In everything that I did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. That was a great talk. Oh, you know, I also have these little things. Yeah. This, this is, I know you guys give something away. Yeah. I actually give something away to people who talk to me. This is a little gear because these conversations get the gears going. Mm -hmm. At least they're supposed to. And would you like to have one of these three pieces as a gift? Can the yellow one? Sure. I'll take the red. Okay. Thank awesome. you very much. And then if either of you see me out here again, or you're, you're in a pair again, or maybe you, they pair you up with somebody else or whatever, okay. or maybe you have somebody else in your organization who you think might be able to help us figure this out better, uh, bring them by. Okay. And but in any case, you can come back and, get, and build out the cell. If the weather's good and I have a little bit of time in my schedule in the morning to the early afternoon, I'm usually here. That's cool. Yeah. Can we email you if we have someone? I beg your pardon. Can we email you if we have someone? Yes. We... Yeah. Yeah. In fact, a lot of people email me to say, "Hey, we're going to be yeah. in in town on this day. Can I stop by and chat with you?" Okay. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank do you, you do you have any more questions it. for me? I don't even think I answered where I stand on your claim. I was going to say, I was, gonna, I was kind of wondering, what, where are you on our claim? On the scale from 0 to 100, where 100 is, I'm absolutely sure that this is true. Yeah. I can't be wrong on it. I can't be mistaken. On your claim that your book is a source of truth and that your God is real, I'm at a 1 or 2% out of, out of 100. Have you read the Book of Mormon before? I haven't. Okay. I haven't. Do you want one? I don't. Okay. Because I would rather have the people who think that it's true explain to me how they got to their conclusion and if it's testable and reliable yep. and you have really good reasons then i will accept your book so i am open to taking it so if we can't let's keep the dialogue open okay what All right so that is uh that is part 1 my headset messed up my my hair um so that is part 1 of uh Anthony Magnum Bosco's first interview that we are sharing Wasn't that fascinating? in that case with two Mormon missionaries. Also, Anthony has joined us in the chat. Yay, so, hey, Anthony, Anthony, so glad you're here. Um, yeah, so we have we have good we have over 400 people listening live right now. 
we want we want to jump right into the the couple that Anthony interviews next. But before we do, um, I, I wrote down some notes on just a couple things that were kind of notable. But Kara, what what are some of the you you edited this excerpt to kind of clean it up a tiny bit? Yeah. What were some of the things that stuck out for you? Um, if you'll notice how there's another actual street epistemology channel called cordial curiosity. So you'll notice the cordial nature in which Anthony um, engages with what are called interlocutors, um, just your interview partner that you're talking to. So um, in a lot of spaces, especially atheists, they want to debate, they want to challenge, they want to go toe to toe talking about doctrine. And that's not the goal whatsoever of street epistemology. It's to get to the the more fundamental baseline of what gives people their, their confidence. And he'll go into, in this next video, into a confidence scale and what um, people's evidences are. And maybe if they had that evidence removed, how their confidence might change from that. So I just love Anthony's kindness and respect that he has. And you'll notice that he has concern and consent and he wants to make sure people are as comfortable as possible. Again, going back to being as cordial as you can be. And I personally identify <laughs> as an atheist. And I hope that a lot of people who are atheists and are talking with somebody who believes in God and you might believe completely different things. I hope that people will um, take a lesson from Anthony on how to engage really respectfully. Can I say, can I yeah. say, you'll, you, you guys will hear this tomorrow when we talk to Anthony about his story. But if any of you remember 9-11 back in 2001, there was there were years of sort of, you know, what, what were called new atheists like Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins. They were just going at believers and just slamming them and mocking them mercilessly and there was a reaction to the new atheists that was basically this is a turnoff uh and and my sense from hearing anthony's story was that he developed this method in part yeah. as a reaction to the new atheists saying if we're jerks we're we're, we're going to be turning people off and, and we're not going to get anywhere so i think he had a commitment to being civil and respectful building and bridges and that's one of the things i love right. about him For just sure. as a human he's just is that way he's a better person than me anthony <laughs> he's a good guy so me, me too. um <laughs> yeah i hope you guys will take away some of his just like cordial um, nature. He's yeah. he's amazing. So thanks for joining in the chat as well, Anthony. And any believers, I know mm -hmm. there might be a believer or two in the chat. So you guys are obviously welcome. Everyone, if you are a fan of street epistemology, we're going to call it SE from now on because I can't say that mouthful so many times. But if you are a fan of SE, please do your best practice in the chat to be nice and cordial with believers in the chat. So that we can continue to have good conversations and we can practice. I, I noticed several people did this. Yeah. We had a, we had a believer show up and say, Hey, all I'm paraphrasing, but like the spirit is something that you, you just feel it. You can't prove it. And several of you in the comments were practicing good speed street epistemology with our believing listeners. And we love that. Let's use our chats as a way to practice street epistemology. Ah, right on. And if you notice from the video, we just showed the missionaries, uh, with street epistemology, you kind of have to go at one claim. And um, with Mormonism, it's kind of a whole package deal. It's the Book of Mormon is true. It's Joseph Smith restored the true gospel. Um, but if you notice, Anthony was kind of peeling back the onion layers to get to the idea that a belief in a God and a God that cares, a God that's intervening was already foundational to those missionaries. And so you kind of have, that's why these conversations can be so long because there are so many layers. And so it's really important to nail down the claim yeah. that your interlocutor <laughs> is making. Um, yeah. Cause it was like, right, the missionaries were like, Hey, if you pray to God, They'll, he'll tell you Book of Mormon is true. And Anthony's like, wait a minute, that assumes there's a God. <laughs> He's like, if there's a God, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so good. establishing yeah. the claim is really important. And then you'll notice just kind of Anthony's technique of making sure to repeat back what the interlocutor is saying. You never want to, in, in a debate style, it's almost common to straw man or misrepresent somebody's argument. We want to do the opposite of that. We want to steel man their argument. We want to say exactly what we think that they're saying to make sure we're not putting words in their mouth. So you notice that he did that. He'll do that in this, in this next interview quite a lot. You'll notice that. And just making sure to clarify and then get into how we test those claims. So without further oh, wait, ado. A couple other things. Yeah, um, go ahead. I love how he always is, is checking in with, you said the interlocutors, is that the term he yeah. uses? He's checking in with them, figuring out where they are, how they're doing. And he doesn't, and he does this with Sean McCraney. This is one of the most powerful parts of the Sean McCraney interview. Just to give you a preview, he checks in. And if he feels like he's putting too much pre pressure or stressing them out or jumping ahead of them in a way that might be unhealthy for them, 
he'll stop and use restraint and say, I think, I think we've done enough for today. Yep. And I, he was checking in with the missionaries to kind of, to do that sort of pacing. I don't know what he calls it, but yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, super pacing. respectful. Um, yeah. They have different, um, courses that street epistemology is going to start and we will be discussing those in the next interviews throughout the day and the very first one is actually informed consent it's to start with your interlocutor and and tell them that i'm going to be asking you some questions and probe at your belief system that might leave you leaving this conversation with maybe some different beliefs than you walked into it are you comfortable with having a conversation that might affect your life from this point forward and some people will say yes and some people will say no so that's another really amazing part of what anthony does and what the people with street epistemology street epistemology international is the uh, nonprofit that anthony helps run so it's i think that's a really important part you know at mormon stories we're all about informed consent so even if it came down to something like people believing in more rational things which is what i would always like to see if it comes at the cost of their mental health or them frame relationships with family or friends it's important to lead with empathy always still um even if we have differing beliefs so that's what i really love about and we technique. saw him do this he lives this he doesn't he just, lives it he doesn't just talk you will about see the sean yeah. mccraney interview it turns very interesting <laughs> you guys yeah, so good and then the missionaries were just like uh, you could tell well, a couple things they're just like they're not used to this a lot of the comments were like they didn't train them for this in the mtc you know what i mean yeah yeah. But they're sweet, they're sweet, thoughtful kids, but you could tell that they had only thought about their faith kind of a couple steps down. Right, right. <laughs> testability, because to a missionary, to a Mormon, testability, we think we have testability, but oh, yeah, just um, Holy Ghost, in real know? world terms, it's sometimes doesn't always hold up, but yeah. Yeah. And then, and then at the end, I just loves, I love it where, where the missionaries are like, so did, you know, what do you think? Are you, are you interested? Are you, is, is our you know, is our position compelling? Give, give us a percentage. And he's like, ah, 2%. Yeah. <laughs> Not super interested. <laughs> yeah. He's blunt, but, um, he's, he's being honest. Being he's, honest. He's being honest. Yeah. Yeah. And if anything, it helps train missionaries better. I hope missionaries will watch this and will come up with some sharper answers when they run into people who have been watching Anthony Magnavosco videos that they will predict what's going to happen next. I mean, it's kind but, of brilliant because the, yeah. they're like, well, why, why aren't you more interested? And he's like, well, unless you give Anthony says, unless you give me a good reason to be more interested, I, we got to start there. You need yeah. to do a better job of coming up for a reason why I should read the book and, and test it out. Because if, 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 if you can't start with a good compelling reason, I'm maybe it's too much time <laughs> to invest. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And I noticed on screen, somebody asked, what is Anthony's goal? And yeah, that's really important. Yeah. And we will get into that ad nauseum. We will definitely get into that in the further interviews this week. So hold tight. This is kind of just to introduce the concepts of street epistemology and maybe I, we didn't want to make this intro outro too long. We just kind of wanted to show clips unless John says otherwise. No, but it's important. The, the goal is not to tear people's faith down per se. It's not to argue. It's not to win someone over. It's yeah. I, I think it's important because I think as uh, sometimes as progressive or doubting or post Mormons, we want, we have some agenda for uh, the people that we talk to. And usually we've talked about this with Margie and the gift of the Mormon faith crisis. Usually it's more about us. We want them to validate where we've gotten to, or at least to not feel so alone. And Anthony's got a really good approach to the ethics of these conversations and, and how you need to do no harm. Right. And you need to sort of follow the pacing of the person you're talking to. We'll get more into that. Right. Because as a society, we need to be able to live with each other and interact with each other. And as you'll see through the interviews throughout this week, as we get into the role play that we're going to do um, on part five, just using these types of questioning techniques is helpful when you have to engage with people who have differing beliefs. So if our Mormon Stories listeners can just, um, yeah, glean something from it that will help them in their day-to-day -day lives, then that's what our goal at least is. So. Lots of great comments. Heidi writes, I seriously need to learn this to engage in a better conversation with my insanely true believing Mormon brothers. Heidi, that's literally why we're doing yeah. uh, this series. That's Anthony Magnabosco Street Epistemology Week. All week, five days in a row on Mormon Stories Podcast. Today is just day one. Yep. All right. Get, Carrie, you want to set up uh, this next video and what it is and what they're going to see and what they should maybe watch out for? Yes. So this is Anthony at a hiking trail. Um, he comes across um, an LDS couple 
one named Jenny, another named Anthony. And the, like I said earlier, the clips that are, that you'll find on his YouTube channel are going to be a little bit longer. So I edited it down a little bit. Um, sorry to, to, to the Mormon Anthony in this video, I cut out, um, what he had to say a little bit. He, what you want to avoid when talking with somebody at interlocutor is to kind of avoid them giving you their doctrine and why they find their religion. So amazing why they find their beliefs. So, so captivating and so meaningful and more dig to just the foundational reasons that they believe it. And so you'll see that his, his partner, I don't know if it's his girlfriend or his wife, Jenny is, she kind of gets what Anthony Magnabosco was going for. So I cut out the other guy a little bit more. So it's just kind of a clip of them discussing and um, investigating their beliefs with them, with Anthony a little bit more. So it's another really great conversation that's really popular on this channel. And with I think the Mormon couple. With the Mormon couple. Yeah. I think you'll enjoy it. And someone just asked if there's a way to donate. I don't know if they meant to Mormon stories or street epistemology, but you can absolutely go to street epistemology.com. There should be links Com, in the link right? tree um, right yeah. below the YouTube video because right now. Because we do want to support Anthony fundraising, and we'll talk more about that in the coming episodes. Yeah, yeah we're definitely going to help him launch some more fundraising things. If he'll let week. us. <laughs> All right. So without any further ado, here is our second clip of a Mormon couple this time meeting Anthony and, and seeing Anthony do street epistemology with the couple. Yeah, it's going to be good. Hope you guys enjoyed, everybody. Keep the comments coming in yeah. the live stream. And thanks again for joining us, Anthony. Good morning. How was your walk? Oh, it's wonderful. Can I offer you some ice water? Uh, no. Oh, no. no? We're, Thank we're you, heading though. We oh. No Thank problem. You. No problem. Would either of you be interested in doing an interview? Five uh, minutes? With a park? Or... I'm not with the park at all. Oh, okay. I have a hobby where I'm practicing something called street epistemology, which is this. I know it's a complicated, like, yeah. weird sounding thing. It's a conversational tool that challenges people's deeply held beliefs in a respectful way. So we pick a belief that people think is true. So like all last week I was here and hear that bird. I think it's a cardinal. So a lot of people think that when you see a cardinal, it's a deceased relative coming back to say hello. Oh, wow. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. I, I didn't either until I came here. But anyways, we pick a belief that somebody really thinks is true, whether it's karma or they believe in a God or they think a cardinal is a deceased relative coming okay. back to them. And I set a timer for five minutes just to like not take much of your time. And I ask questions to probe the reliability of the method you use to conclude that your beliefs are true. Ooh, okay. It's really interesting. Yeah. Interesting. It's honestly a little challenging with two. But I've, I've had conversations where I've interviewed two people once, if you share the same belief. Oh, yeah. Okay. Do you want to do a short little fiver? Sure, we got five minutes. Can we go in the shade? Would you yeah. mind? Yeah, I'd prefer okay. that. Okay. I'm Anthony, by the way. Anthony. Oh, right. oh he's yeah, Anthony. I'm nice Jenny. Name. Hi. Anthony, also. Anthony and Jenny. Sorry, our hands. Hand is that's all right. Do you guys so want, want so the water? Like, no, really, we're fine. Okay. So is this like for your schooling or is no, this like a personal? There's study? this thing called street epistemology where people are going out and having talks. I've been doing this for like five years now. And um, it's 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 a, sort of like a, like I talked about. It's like a method for probing people's beliefs to see if. So is it just like a hobby? It's my personal it's hobby. It's a personal That's hobby. Awesome. But I've been doing it so much that, and I've been I've been recording my talks if, with your permission, yeah. and uh, people have been watching them and going out and doing it as well. And that not that I started it or anything. I'm just trying to help. Promoted no, that, by recording. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's a good yeah, thing. I think that's you're trying to maybe reach a uh, understanding of maybe purpose of life. Mm, Almost. I think like for, me, general, for me, for like, me, for me, honestly, it's more about a pursuit for truth. Truth. Okay. Because like if that. I meet, if if that's true, that that bird is my dad who passed away two years ago, oh, then okay. I want to know about that. Yeah. However. I also like to challenge people a little bit through questioning to see how they could be so sure that that is my dad who's telling me oh, hello oh, or something like that. Yeah. I appreciate you stopping. Yeah, no problem. I understand it's a little unusual to um, to be asked about like a deeply held belief. No, not for us. We like to share our beliefs. We're uh, Latter Day Saints. Interesting. Oh, excellent! I'm so, so glad yeah. to run into you. Yeah. So we, <laughs> okay. we are, are otherwise known as. Mormons. Yep. Right, yep. so you, you've heard them. That's good. A lot of people haven't heard of the, the religion. Oh, yeah. We like to uh, uh, to spread we the like gospel um, as, yeah. as much as... 
to those who we, we compare it as like sharing a piece of cake. It's like, hey, we have some cake here. If you're interested, would you like some cake? I'll tell you why we like enjoy the cake. This is why we like it. <laughs> Perfect. We'd like you to try it. If you don't want to try it, all right. Well, at least you know about there's cake here for you. Yeah. So that's like kind that's of awesome. like you know, a little summary real quick. No, I, I, I am totally with you on that. Like I think if – if what you're believing in is true, back to the whole cardinal thing, like mm -hmm. if that's true, I'm gonna rotate this just a little bit. If that belief is true, then I definitely want to learn it. So, oh, yeah. and, and, and in fact, if I discovered that it was true, I would probably be just as open about sharing it with other people as it sounds like you guys are. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, so what I'm interested in, however, is mm -hmm. if there really is cake. Okay. If oh. this thing is really true. Ooh, okay. Okay. So I'd like to kind of get a sense of, of how you determined that it's that what you're believing in that, uh, Joseph Smith and the book of Mormon and this God is real. Ooh, nice. okay. Can Good. we, can we explore that a little bit? Yeah. And here's my caveat. <laughs> Try to not let the other person's answer influence you. Oh, if, yeah. if that's possible. Like his answer influence, like what I say? Right. Okay, so you want yeah. to, should I give my account first? Yeah, yeah, and sure. And then do, I'll give, yeah. Like I'll say my, not account, but. The, like, maybe the main justification why you actually think that this God is real. Okay. Um, I guess for me, I, I would like to say that I know that it's real mm -hmm. based on the fruits of my exercising the beliefs because I see that like promises that are given, if you do certain things that they are fulfilled, like it's because good things come from me acting on my beliefs. Gotcha. Okay. That's beautiful. And I'm going to repeat it back just to make sure I understand it. Uh, the main justification that you have that your God exists is that when you act upon the beliefs that you have. Or like teachings that I receive. Okay. You see the benefits, uh, you see good things as a result of that. The fruits, I think yeah. is what you're referring to. Okay. Or the fulfillment of promises that are given if you do act on those things. Okay. So you might read something in scripture and then you, you just go about your daily life and you have the belief and then you see things that validate the scripture. I, I suppose so. I suppose you could say Please that. don't let me put words in your mouth if that's not what you're saying. No, no, no. I would, I mean, I suppose, so I guess more like, if I read like a commandment and a mm. promise that is tied to that commandment and I live out what I'm said you should do, that I feel that promise is fulfilled. Okay. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Like they say, you know, like if you pay tithing, then you will have financial blessings. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that way. Okay. And then you've actually tithed and then you're seeing financial blessings. Mm -hmm. And then that complete circle is validation that you're believing in something that's true. I think so. Okay. Well, okay. So as yeah. for me, in my words, so I grew up without religion. I grew up with mm -hmm. a basis of my religion was a small Catholic belief so that I believe that there was a God. I believe that there was a son, Jesus Christ. So I grew up with those beliefs. And I, the reason I grew up with them because my parent raised us that way. So that's what I knew. So at the age of 22, I, well, let me go backwards. About 10 years, maybe 12, 13, I kind of, I want to say kind of, because I would still uh, participate in church services, as in twice a year. I'd go maybe for Easter and Christmas. Mm -hmm. But then other than that, I really didn't practice any religion. In my back of my mind, I always knew I felt that there was a God. So I was always on the edge of maybe there isn't, maybe there is. And I was looking for physical proof in my late teen years to my early 20s. And then, about my 20 years, I think I was, I want to say think, because at the time was I never physically asked for it, but I was open to suggestions. I was open to conversation about religion. I talked to an, a Latter-day Saint person, a missionary, mm -hmm. and they asked me to do something. Forum, and they asked me to read the Book of Mormon. I, I'm just kind of summarizing this up. Please. And so with those conversations about reading the Book of Mormon, I learned that 
religion cannot be proven. If it is proven, then religion itself is thrown in the garbage because religion is based on faith and not knowing that something really is true. It's, it's based on the fact of believing, hoping, and seeing the results. Now, okay. with that, yeah, I find that these beliefs can be very complex and the doctrine gets very deep. And my focus is is more on how we can be so sure that it's true. Okay. And I think you said uh, that you grew up with a, a belief in a God. Yeah. You always felt something, mm -hmm. that it was true. And you wanted physical proof. But I think at some point you, correct me if this isn't what you're saying, but at some point you, you realized that... Uh, physical proof is not at our at your disposal that you need something else no physical well, proof like it's not necessary well, no, physical proof is not necessary in yeah. order for the a belief to occur in order to mm. have faith you well, i guess have i guess i would proof. say more and maybe you said not to do this but i think what trying to say, <laughs> this could be completely free-flowing yeah. yeah like is that physical proof isn't necessary for things to be true that you can have a knowledge of truth without physical proof that mm. it is there. Okay, so this would be a great opportunity to introduce a confidence scale okay. from zero to 100. I want to get a sense of how sure you are that this belief is true. That's the first part. And then there's okay. a second part that will hinge off of this, this idea of proof. Okay. Okay, so on a scale from zero to 100, I'd like to get a sense of how sure each of you are that your God is real. 100% is there's no question in my mind. I have no doubt. I know that it's true. 0% is all I have is questions. I don't know that this thing is true at all. I say for me, it's 100%. I have no doubt. I'm at more of a 101. <laughs> a, what? You know, a 101, I was going to say. Especially, yeah. Um, yeah. so, yeah, the, and then um, especially just the, the past few uh, weeks, I've it's even, so... Could I ask the second part of my oh, that little yeah, question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Because I just don't want to lose my train of thought. And then we can definitely go back to that. Definitely. Okay. Okay. Um, I think you said that you don't need proof to to be certain that your God is real. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, how should I phrase this? If assuming that you do have proof, if you didn't have that proof. I hate to use the word proof. I kind of like okay. to say evidence. It's a little, soft, little okay. softer. But let's say that you didn't have evidence for this God. Where would it move you from the 100? What would what would be a, a corrective adjustment? I would be a zero. Yeah. If you didn't have the evidence that you think that you have now, is yeah, that right? I'd be a zero. And, and my, well, I'll, I'll let her answer. Then okay. Yeah. This, this is great. Is. Yeah. Go ahead. I guess I don't, I don't really know. I don't, because I guess. For me, honestly, I don't know that I've looked for evidence. You have this belief that's not based on evidence. Well, the, I, don't, the, I guess I, I don't know. That's well, a really... Here's the thing. Is it going to take my, me... My thing is the evidence... <laughs> She's I like, know, hold, on, not, hon. hold on, I'm thinking. You, I'm really trying to think. I know, but are you looking for physical evidence or... No, whatever evidence like, we gave, right? Like I said... Do you want to move you in the shade just a oh, tad? Because oh, you're in the sun. I, said, I, I don't want I you in the sun. like my evidence was like the fruits of... Oh, I see. Um, yeah, like yeah, we sort of went saying. over what our evidence yeah. was, and I'm saying like, so without that, mm -hmm. would I believe? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess I, I would think that I do. I think I would still be able to say 100% because I truly feel as though like it has been ingrained within within me that I do have a testimony that it is true. Okay. Like, I, and I, I truly don't think that that could be removed. Okay. If so, things, if circumstances change. All right. I want to repeat back what I think you've just said, and then we can we can go over to Anthony here. You're 100 percent confident that your God exists. Yes. Any evidence that you think that you may have, I don't even think that you're going as far as to say that you even think that you have evidence just yet. No, but I mean, yeah. I mean, I think like I've said why I believe that. Yeah. I think what you're saying is that even if I discovered that I have no evidence for this belief, I'm still going to be 100 percent confident that it's true does sound odd i think to like the humanistic side but i just think the spiritual side of me just knows and i can't remove that like that's sort of like my inner soul and that's what i was going to say that that's why knows. i was waiting for you to answer so physical evidence i don't mean anything like here's a 
you know, this is just a reference. Here's the proof right here. It's signed. It's, you know, this is the evidence. Okay. No, that what it was told in the beginning when I spoke with that missionary was, a, it was like, you read this book, you pray about it, and you'll get a feeling that you'll know for yourself. Mm. A feeling like uh, something that is like a, a for sure feeling like you probably got when you were growing up and yeah. and something just told you. And, and when he okay. when he used yeah. the word something, he didn't spe specify whether it was the Holy Ghost or some kind of a spirit or uh, some kind of uncle or aunt or an angel or anything like that. Mm. It was it was told to me a feeling that, you know, that it is right. And that is what I go on. So if you call that proof, well, then that's my proof. But there's nothing mm. actual physical okay. that, that actually that's going to show you that what's okay. going on is right. So in the interest of wanting to fully understand what you just said, I'm going to repeat it back. Oh, yeah, definitely. And again, correct me if this isn't what you're saying. That uh, you ran into somebody who basically told you that the way that you, you can know for sure that the Book of Mormon is true and the scriptures are true and, and that all this stuff happened and that this God is real is that when you commit to it, you will get a feeling that it's true. And then the feeling that you got and maybe that you still get today is what you would point to as evidence to be 100% certain. Yes. And it's the fee yeah, the feeling of evidence. Yeah. The same feeling I got when I was younger mm -hmm. and throughout my life. Mm -hmm. right, up until that point. Okay. Okay. So almost like a conscience conscience feeling, but I don't even know if I'm saying that right. You just like recognize that it was the same feeling you'd had mm -hmm. when you were young. In the okay. as I went through the church, many what I know today is they say it's the influence of the Holy Ghost is what we believe in. But before I joined the church, it was there wasn't a name for it. Maybe uh, uh, maybe I could have said conscience mm -hmm. or maybe I could have. How big of a component is feeling for just knowing that your God is real for you? How big of a component is feeling? That's 100 percent for me. I yes. That first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For me, um, I. I guess I don't know. I feel like I'm not doing a very good job of answering this. Um, I guess I think it used to be like a feeling. And for me now, it's just a knowledge. So I don't, and that's why I'm saying mm. I don't know that I relate okay. the feelings that I have with it. You um, felt for so long that it's true that now you actually say uh, that you know no, that it's true. I guess what I mean is I, I used to find like those moments of feeling mm -hmm. and like connecting were sort of my evidence and sort of where my testimony lie. Okay. And then I sort of transcended that and I feel like I've had enough of that that I know. Like there's no way that I could deny it. That it's gotcha. Fair. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. I meet a lot of people on the trail who believe completely different things are true. Like the Cardinal that's still going yeah. on. Right. Yeah. And I meet a lot of people who believe that other gods are real because they have a feeling that it's true. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like in your situation, Anthony, if this individual happened to be an imam and actually thought that Allah was true and that the Quran was the right book. And he said, you know, if you just read this book and you, you, you start pondering on it, that you will get, you'll get a feeling. And that feeling is, is Allah. That feeling is justification to believe that Muhammad flew to heaven on a winged horse. And that feeling reminded you of a feeling when you were a young kid. Is it conceivable that somebody could have a feeling and it guide them to the incorrect conclusion? Yes. Yes. And now, however, however, the thing is, and we were kind of discussing that on the trail, the thing is, and in, in here's what makes the Mormon, this is what kind of drew me to the Mormon religion too, is because one of the articles of faith in the Mormon religion, so basically the articles of faith are a summary of what the whole beliefs of the church are about. Mm. So one of them is let any man, woman, believe who, what, when, and where, and how they want to worship 
I mean, I didn't say it word for word. If, it's, if it's leading towards a good purpose, mm. if it's not breaking any laws, then well, that's a good thing for that individual. I'm on board with this idea mm -hmm. of people having the right to believe whatever they want. But my question is, well, are you able to repeat back what you think my question yeah, is? Yeah, I think your question was if if someone asks me to like read the Quran or the, all these people who have, um, you know, people who have other beliefs, if they've read something and they have that same good feeling that like we've experienced, can it lead them to have a belief in something different or that not only different, but something that's, that's not wrong. That's not that's true. true. That's not true. And I guess I would say this. I don't believe that. I think that they could experience that feeling and have a testimony in something that has a portion of truth. It may not have all of the truth, mm. but that there may be a part of that that is a light and a truth. Yeah. So and I guess I don't know that, but yeah, I guess I well, could. Let me ask you this, oh, yes, wait, yes, no. yes or no, okay, yes or yeah. no. Is it conceivable that a person can rely on feelings and come to the incorrect conclusion? Yes. I would, yes. I would think yeah. yes. Just like you see. I well, would think so. Okay. Incorrect. Because I think everybody, I, I'll talk. Um, I think that everybody has like a gap or a hole and you can, you know, everybody's sort of searching for something. And for some people, I think that they can connect with something that could be dark or twisted and they will fall into that because for them, it's kind of filling that hole Yeah, I mean, because of whatever's happened in their past. And they or feel that it's the right way to go. They feel, well, right. And I think they think it's right because it's kind of, Filling in whatever. Okay. No, go ahead. Too, like games, right? Like young kids, like like they they're getting involved in bad things, but there are good feelings that they are getting from it because it's fulfilling something that was missing from their life. Okay. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, so I want to circle back. I think so. I want to circle back to this idea of using feelings to conclude that something is true. Okay. So yeah, there might be a tribe in in Africa, and they take the chicken bones, and when they're falling down the stairs. They land and then they make decisions on what to do for that day based on the arrangement of the bones. Or um, then you have the the Muslim terrorists, like the, they okay. they hijack planes and crash them into buildings because they felt that their belief was true. Yeah, but so, again, that was a certain little group of Muslims. Right, because I don't think that that's you know, like the Muslim It wasn't Muslim the whole belief. religion yeah. belief. <laughs> okay. It was like the little. Yeah. Piece. <laughs> it's like some of the Mormons decided to let me come over here and do poor marriages. Yeah. And it's like, which that doesn't take place in the actual. So my question to you is, if we recognize that feelings can lead people to incorrect conclusions mm -hmm. and your beliefs are largely based on feelings, mm -hmm. how can either of you be 100% sure that it's true? Because, because of the knowledge of falling within the parameters. If you're doing what you're supposed Again, to be yeah, doing in your religion. So, okay, for instance, Muslims. If they are doing what they're supposed to be doing, if they are following and abiding uh, abiding by every law that they believe in, well, in the Mormon religion, at the very end, when you die, you are going to be judged. So this is what we believe. We believe Jesus Christ is going to judge you on your actions. So let's say a Muslim grew up or whoever, you, you whatever religion you want, that is a peaceful religion, that obeys the laws of the land, that does everything well, when they die, they're going to be judged by Jesus Christ. They're going to be judged on... So how do you know that? That's what he's saying. Well, yeah, I'm going to go into Ex that. Yeah. Excellent question, Jenny. I'm, I'm gonna, that's, yeah. Okay, that's what I'm getting at. Is, yeah, oh, like, yeah. like just directly yeah. answer. I know like, that that's how, what you believe. Yeah. Right, so like how do you know that? But well, if, again, if you're wait, feeling I'm, so I'm going to flip it around. Oh, yeah, that wasn't done. Sorry. Cut me off. So, <laughs> But anyways... So when all it's said and done, you're being judged. And when you're judged on based on whatever your actions were and the end, you are going to be account uh, accountable for every, every single thing that was thought of and what was that. So going back around was that you know, it's true because you know that the feelings inside you are correct. Does, did, did I make oh, like because they lead you to correct things. Yeah, because inside, okay. see, so we believe. So okay, that we I see are, what you're saying. We are born with almost like. What a Muslim state. told me the same thing. Right. What's that? You're saying like, so how do we know? Uh, no, let me. Pre yeah. I think it okay. hurt. Go, go Wouldn't a Muslim tell me the exact same thing? Yes, that's what I'm saying. So at the end, if they feel their religion is right, we feel our religion is right, and we're living in peace and harmony. Well, in the end, 
we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know because that's not allowed. Again, going backwards, we're not allowed to know what's going to happen. How could you be 100% sure if you don't know? Based on feelings. You have to feel these things because that's the whole test. That's the whole test on Earth. Sure. What was your original question? The fundamental question here, I think, is both of you, it seems, largely believe that your God is real because of the feelings that you get for holding the belief. And we recognize that other people can conclude that completely different things are true because they have a feeling. I'm trying to think now if one of the ladies I talked to last week thought that she thought that these birds were talking to her because mm-hmm. she had a feeling she might have okay. it wouldn't be out of the out of the ordinary for someone to say mm-hmm. that's definitely your dad talking to you because you'll just feel it that it's true okay. mm-hmm. the question here I think is if we recognize that feelings don't always lead us to yeah. the truth yeah. how can you be so sure that the oh, feelings that you're having to a hundred percent certainty is leading you to the truth I guess I would say for me, it's not, I can't, it's not something that I could give to you. And it's not something I can give to you. It's just, it is, for me, it's not just a feeling, it is truly a knowledge. And I don't know how, and that's why I think you're encouraged to develop that knowledge for yourself. Would you advise somebody to use feelings to conclude that something is true? when you recognize that it might lead me to the incorrect conclusion. I would only yeah, advise yes. somebody to oh. do that. I would only advise somebody to do that if it was something that I had experimented on and knew that there were good fruits from doing that. Does that make sense? Yet the Muslim would tell me the exact same thing about yeah, but yes, there, but I would, fruits. And I would right? agree that there are positive fruits from yeah, yes, their that, religion that's what also. I but I, 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 I don't think we can speak for the world, but I can only speak for myself. And so I would only ever encourage someone to try trial something or to try to develop a knowledge of their own in the way that I have experienced Mm. and it's something that I feel is good. And so I guess I would say, and looking at people who like Muslim extremists who are terrorists, maybe for them, they are truly trying to spread something that they believe. Mm -hmm. And I guess I wouldn't, I, I don't know. But I can't speak you know, to that. I thought of another question I'd like to ask you related to the belief scale. Mm-hmm. I asked you if you uh, if you didn't have evidence, where would you be? And you said, well, zero. And, fa- and feeling is your evidence. And I think you said, even if I really discovered I didn't have evidence, I'd still be, I'd still know it. So my question is, since it seems like this is largely based on the feeling that you get that it's true, mm-hmm. let me ask you this. If you discovered through the course of this conversation or afterwards when hopefully you're talking about this, if you were to discover that feelings are not a reliable way to come to know that something is true, mm-hmm. what influence would that have on your confidence that this God is real, that 100% that you have now? I don't, think I, would be, I don't think I would be affected. That may be a naive assumption, mm-hmm. but I don't. I don't understand. The because question. for me, it's not. Mm-hmm. It, I, for me, again, I think it is beyond feeling. Well, let me it's clarify for Anthony here. If so you couldn't like use feelings like to conclude to with 100 percent certainty that your god is real okay. if, if for some reason someone said a dictate from on high mm-hmm. or something like in your scripture you discovered that uh, feelings are an unreliable way to come to the truth okay yeah and you had to pull that out of your out of your arsenal mm-hmm. uh, that you're using to get to the hundred yeah what influence would that have well if if we were told like in our if our if the scripture we're reading right now said, don't go on your feelings, <laughs> go on the world. Is that what you're saying? It's a bad example yeah. because I'm sort of using a, your, your holy book oh, okay. uh, to help so, you lower your confidence. Well just, just to, well, just to make it sense. So if one of our church leaders, if our, our, our president of the church, or if our scripture said, don't go on your feelings anymore, go like this, I would listen to his counsel at the point where I'm at now. Prior to joining the church, I wouldn't listen. I, I would think he was some normal, regular guy. I for, I asked you a horrible question because I, yeah, I yeah. basically used your own holy book mm-hmm. to ask if that would lower your confidence. So can I rephrase this question? Sure. Sure. If, if at the end of this talk, you discovered that faith is unreliable. I think I even asked this. Not faith. Sorry. Uh, if you feelings. if you discovered at the end of this talk, your shirt just is reminding me of that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> If you discovered at the end of this talk and through subsequent discussions with people, maybe even yourselves, 
and you discovered that feelings were unreliable, yet they comprise such a large part of why you're sure, mm -hmm. would that in turn have a corresponding influence on your certainty? Would you be adjusting down to the 50 if you realized uh, that feelings were unreliable? No. Maybe you had to remove well, feelings. What would, you, what would your evidence be? In a sense, again, like where? Again, it would be religion. There would be no evidence. So you couldn't, I mean, without feelings, then you have nothing. I don't know how. I think I feel differently. It sounds like what you're saying is mm -hmm. that even if you discover that feelings were unreliable, you would still hold the belief. I would. And I think only because I still see the evidence of putting into practice in my life the teachings mm -hmm. and the the benefits and the good fruits and the things that it can do for the Are world. you seeing the fruits? I see the evidence yes. of that. And it's that that goes beyond feeling that to me is almost like a physical proof mm -hmm. not that i think that that's necessary but i think i've seen enough of that in my life yes so that i still have the feelings but well, i don't know that they are necessary i just want to say this without feelings then it would go into survival of the fittest mode it would be in the animal you'd be in the primitive animal <laughs> world where you would live this know. life you mean go, like if we didn't have feelings yeah, well if you didn't use feelings based for your guide guidance because yeah. We're using our feelings to guide us. Yeah. Again. Do true. feelings always lead us to reliable conclusions? No. Well, obviously again, not, because that's why we're tr okay. being tried right now. Can I can I follow up on something that you said about the fruits, mm -hmm. if you don't mind? Mm -hmm. um, my question to you about the the fruit. It sounds like what you're saying is that if you discover that you don't have evidence and you discover that feelings were unreliable, you'd still be you'd still have a very high degree of confidence that the God is real because you see fruits of having the belief. You, you you see things that are happening in your life that correspond with what you've read in the scripture. Yes. And then that's the validation to you that this belief is true. It does it does help to validate. Yeah. Okay. So my question is if you weren't exposed to these beliefs in the first place, mm -hmm. and if you hadn't already used feelings to be sure that the belief is true and that you just know that it's true. Would you be looking at these positive things that are happening in your life as fruits of your belief or as normal everyday occurrences that just tend to happen to people in 2017 who are living in the United States? I think I probably would view it that way. Like they're just sort of normal everyday things. I, I guess I don't know. I've always I've always had that like faith as an origin. So that's probably mm -hmm. hard for me to understand or to answer truthfully because I've never come from a different place. Okay. But I would imagine that, like, had without the teachings or that I have, like, to back up mm -hmm. my direction, mm -hmm. that I would just think, yeah, that's just, you know, good things happen to good people. Or, mm. you know what I mean? Just sort of think it's just an energy of the world or something like that. So being told, correct me if this isn't it, is being told that the belief is true very early on, uh, skewing your ability to objectively look at the belief. Okay. That's a good um, question. That is a great question. But I would say, I would say maybe for some people, I would think not for myself only because I was never told, I wasn't told that it has to be true. I was told to figure it out for myself. Kind of. I definitely have, I think I have a better understanding of, of what you believe and why and how you think you're, how you are arriving at your 100% confidence. So yeah, we can definitely wrap it up. I got a card. And uh, if you guys want to meet again, that's fine. Or you can email yeah. me. Uh, awesome. Sometimes people will message me six months later to say, awesome. I was thinking about it. And I was really thinking about feelings and wondering if, if that's a reliable way. And if I wasn't raised with this belief, would I would I be looking at things differently? And, uh, and some, sometimes people ponder on these things. Yeah. Well, good luck with yeah, your research. You. It's I, really fascinating. I, it's really I, interesting. This, thank you. I wish I had that much time in my life to do that. Uh, like, yeah. My <laughs> kids are at school or I'm a stay at home dad. Yeah. So they're oh, at school good today. For you. That's awesome. yeah. That's really cool. No, just, well, your kids will probably grow up to be very I, big thinkers, I'm sure. Maybe so. You, probably, you, know, you must have like a degree in philosophy or something. No, I don't have a degree in philosophy. If I was going to go back and get a, get, get a degree, I think it'd probably be psychology. Oh, yeah. Because I'm really interested in, in how people are forming these beliefs and that's awesome. Thing. So do you have any beliefs of your own? Like what is your Do you want me to get belief? into this? 
Yeah. Okay, because yeah. I think well, your wife wanted well, to go. I'll just, like maybe, and then I'll email. In a nutshell, I'm, I'm curious because okay, this is kind of what we. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I like conversation like this. I love it too. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, in a nutshell, on that same scale, mm -hmm. from zero to one hundred, I'm right now at about a two. Okay. okay. However, when I have conversations with people, I'm reluctant to admit that because it tends to put people on the defensive, or um, they might want to start preaching and then I don't get into why you think it's true yeah. and how you concluded that you're it's not true. wanting to learn the theology. You're just kind of wanting yeah. to learn the, yeah. the epistemology. I, I'm interested. I, epistemology is the study of how, how people come to know things. Like uh, I haven't met a lot of Mormons. I've been looking forward to meeting Mormons. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited to run into you both. Nice, nice. And that was really cool. However, it is common for me to hear that people are believing in completely different gods because of those same reasons right. they were raised it they were told it they uh, they study it and they see the fruits of their belief uh, that they get a feeling it's they feel in their bosom that it's that it's allah that it's vishnu and and they actually they, they say that they're 100 sure that these things are true can i ask you one more question and you can just think about it you know you have to answer it go get your food <clears throat> um if you had at your disposal evidence that's different than personal experiences from other people okay. and feelings okay. and uh, and then seeing the fruits of i guess another per that's sort of personal experience now that i think about it so if you had, if you had evidence that was not personal experience and it wasn't feelings would you prefer to have that evidence over those others mm -hmm. i think for myself no no i wouldn't because mm -hmm. i wouldn't have believed it no, I, I, I guess, yeah. Oh, I just think oh, that because I grew up with, yeah, I grew yeah. up in a non. For me, it's necessary. Right. Like, I just think that there's a necessary element of faith. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. I would need feelings, definitely. Is it more virtuous to have your belief based on feelings and not evidence? No, um, I don't think so. But I guess, I guess I would say this. Like, I think that there is. I believe that there is an eternal being like within me and without that faith and knowing that way um i think i wouldn't have such a deep rooted knowledge i think seeing something is not as eternal or long lasting does that make sense your preference would be feelings over evidence um, yeah, that's my per. That's my. I think so. Feelings, and again, because I think hundred percent. I, I guess evidence. feelings is a little bit tricky for me, but I guess having a spiritual confirmation. That's because feeling. for me, that yeah, it is. Is that what feeling, faith is? But I see you, you mentioned faith a couple times. Yeah, and I guess I think faith that that is what feeling, faith yeah. is. Yeah. It's it's believing it in something me and I'm that not isn't doing. there. Like I yeah. believe a hundred percent. That there is a guy standing right behind that tree right now, even though you can't see anything there. No, I know that. That's I feel yeah. that. But, but I guess I'm saying that's know, why I mean, I, I'm trying to right explain now, why. But that, that would just be a, that's an example. I'm just explaining that that's why I prefer <clears throat> that because for me that is an of eternal lasting, whereas mm. experiences in this life are temporary. Okay, so, deep deep question here. I know these have been really deep. Are you content with going off of faith and feelings? because you can never discover that the belief was not true oh okay um no no i i guess i i don't really know how else to say it, but no i i mean i i feel like i could be handed physical evidence mm -hmm. that something that i've learned within the book of mormon or something is not true and i would still have the knowledge that i do I, Which that does almost does sound this, naive and this, ignorant does, to it to a human. Does this help mind, answer that though. question too? So if they gave me the Book of Mormon when I was twenty years old, before I prayed or did anything, mm -hmm. I would get the Book of Mormon and use it as my fire, you know, to help fuel my fire. But based on feelings and knowing what's going on and praying and knowing if you read this or it was pray about it read it and then pray again to ask to see if it's true after knowing that and having have a feeling a confirmation of feeling then i know for a certain 100 percent that it is true but would you rather have physical evidence well question. that's the thing First well let me let me yeah. 
So anyways, no, no, now, like just like I was going to say, just like two weeks ago, there was almost like, it's almost physical evidence now that the Book of Mormon is true. Like there was a talk just a, a week ago that was talking about the Book of Mormon. It's like, so in a, almost like in a, in a perspective of like, how can this be done? Like, how could this guy write this book in this amount of time without any revisions, without any kind of publisher, without this or that? without any kind of a knowledge <laughs> to, to write a 500 page book and it goes a little in depth into like more all into about like the semantics of how the book of mormon came to be and it's like yeah. there's almost like that's, that's almost more like of like a physical, physical sense but do you prefer but that would I have, that's that's, that's the talk? question what, what, I have, what, what i'm saying is before i was uh before i i did all my feelings like if i if you would have brought me that evidence at age 20 i wouldn't have i would have laughed at that evidence Interesting. Oh, okay. I would use so okay. feelings have to come first. Oh, all right. Okay. So be, let me let me summarize. Yeah. Because you have a deep feeling that it's true. Mm -hmm. When you look at things that you would chalk up to not being evidence, if you hadn't had the feeling, yeah. you're more likely to call it sufficient evidence because you have the feelings. Let me see. Yeah. So say, wait, I can repeat it. Yeah. Repeat yeah. It one more time. Okay. <laughs> yeah Back in the day. Okay. If you were to see something that they would call evidence, you would just be like, come on, that's not. However, today, because you have the feeling that it's true, yeah. when you see something that you would have looked at and scoffed at, mm -hmm. today you're more likely to accept it because you have the feeling that it's true. Yes. Feeling, again, that tells you this is the path you need to go. You need to start. But yeah, I get you. Yeah, you have to be prepared. You got to be prepared. It. Okay. So, like, I don't know, twenty minutes ago or something, we were talking about feelings and that they are they can be unreliable and lead people to the wrong conclusions. Mm -hmm. And yet, you're using feelings to be sure that your belief is true. And when you look at something that you would have earlier scoffed and said that that's not evidence, mm -hmm. because you have feelings, which we've already said are probably unreliable, you are more prone to accept something because you already have this feeling that it's true. Did you say feelings were unreliable? Yeah. It, it I mean, did, did we not? Uh, did we not conclude that? No, I know that? what you're mm -hmm. saying. Uh, uh, if well, we didn't, I thought. I, I thought we, because I, we, we yeah, were talking I, about how um, people who believe that's chicken bones, mm -hmm. that they have a feeling that that's true. People yeah. who believe it. And, and the judgment. Well, but of I that, think we were saying. Yeah, I guess yeah. what I believe is so, that that there's a portion of truth or light, but I guess feelings can be unreliable, but I, you're but, using the word feelings. Oh, and I okay. Think that maybe. That's, yeah. yeah. Okay. Cause so let, let me, let me rephrase I think that. that there's so almost if, something if that you were, can't describe, but it isn't yeah. like it is. If you were doing so, so now what, what, if you're doing something, your, your feeling is right. If you know, it's right. If you feel it's right. And it turns out to be a wrong sense. Now here's the thing. When I say wrong, mm -hmm. there is a level of wrong. You can, there's a wrong where I, I, I know there's a wrong where I, I accidentally ended up at Whataburger instead of going to McDonald's. And then there's a wrong where, hey, I murdered people and, you know, I went this route and nobody got hurt. You know, there's a there's a wrong like I decided to drink and drive and I killed people. I decided to okay. drink and drive and nobody died. So based on feelings were there. Well, you got to have your feelings. You're going to be wrong with your feelings. Everyone's going to be wrong at a certain point. However, there's a point where your feelings are making you feel good and everything's right. So that's the path to take. So hence the reason. Oh, like if it's leading you on a good path. Yes, if because, your feeling because is leading you on a good path. In the religion then, we're in. Well, here, here's, here's, saying, here's the question I, I'd like to ask. Yeah, is, like, well, are, here's my question. Okay. Are, are feelings testable? Can we test the reliability of feelings? No, I don't, I don't think, think you can. So. This, this I don't think so. Do you think you can? You Let yeah. me rephrase this. Can we test the reliability of feelings that bring us to conclude that things are true? The only way to uh, test them is to do them. Yeah, because, I mean, I think to them, act on them and see that, that good on, yeah. things come. And, and like hope, what? Yeah, that's yeah. the only way to do it. Cause So what are we thinking, guys? What have, what are your impressions of the one and only Anthony Magnavos? I'm asking the <laughs> Monsters listeners. It's a theoretical question. Yeah, those are our two <laughs> clips that we wanted to show. So we are excited to read your comments later. And we're excited for you to join us for the rest of this week of episodes. So I hope that was a good exercise and just kind of highlighting 
the technique that Anthony is known for. So did you have any reactions to that second video? I wrote down some notes. A lot of uh, viewers and listeners have some comments as well. What were Yeah, the first one, just off the bat, you need to understand if you're listening to this through the podcast that they're both wearing like BYU blue. <laughs> and Jenny's got a big shirt that says Faith that you probably got at like girls camp or youth conference <laughs> from being like a leader. So she looks adorable. And Anthony, he looks a little bit more like kind of aggressive, like he's trying to talk a lot and if the, the body language really comes across, if you're listening to this on audio, I would encourage you to go watch, maybe even go give a, a view over to Anthony's channel and go watch the, the longer full version. And you'll see Anthony, Mormon Anthony's body language that he really just wants to jump in a lot. And so I have to give props to this couple that they just want to engage in, in the conversation about their faith and their beliefs. And I think there's more comments on the YouTube channel about their relationship dynamic and like patriarchy than, than even what they're actually the subject that they're can, discussing. Can I just say so. like one of my early episodes of Mormon Stories podcast, one of the first videos I ever did was of Brooke and John McClay. And John McClay had just like weeks before left a position as like an institute director at like Colorado Springs University or whatever, Colorado State. Air Force Academy, I don't know what it was, but like there were so many comments if he would like talk over Brooke or like touch her knee and start, you know, try to silence her. And, and same vibes here. So many people are like, there's some patriarchy triggering yeah, there's like going a, on here. Yeah. And I, I don't want to be mean or like pile on either, right? Because this couple just was walking down a trail and just <laughs> like, yeah, sure, I'll talk to you. And Anthony obviously like told them that he was going to put this on his YouTube channel. So they were really good sports. So um, please we, be we nice won't to pile, them. We won't pile on. <laughs> yeah. But it so, is a, it is a lesson. It's, it's in, interesting. It's a, it's a visual lesson in Mormon patriarchy a little bit. A visual lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Body language wise. So I just want to put that out there. That's almost like the elephant in the room, which is just kind of like and you edited, dynamic. You edited a little bit I out. took a a lot yeah. of what Mormon Anthony had to say out because he gets very you preachy hate men. You hate because um no, kidding, patriarchy. Well, <laughs> no, no. It's really just because um it distracts from what Anthony Magabosco is trying to do. And I think the SE community will be very grateful for me for <laughs> like condensing that that interview. And go go to go to the Street Epistemology or Anthony Magnabosco YouTube channel and watch the unedited version because we want to give them all the views and the clicks as possible. So. Yep. You can return. We'll, we'll put a link up to that. Yeah. 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 So make sure you check out the links that will be in the show notes below. And so um, if you notice uh, with the things that pop off, like the top of my head is just kind of the circular logic that if you noticed how truthful Jenny kind of came across where she's like, OK, yeah, I do already have this belief. And then when I'm acting on it, I'm looking for um confirming evidence that it's already true and that I and then when Anthony asks questions like would you recommend this method for another person to determine truth and her answer is well if I already acted on the fruit so there's like a circular reasoning there where she already believes that it's true and she's only looking for uh uh it's confirmatory that's a word right sure confirmatory evidence I guess I could say so that's kind of what comes across if you know, going over and over again, going back in these, these kind of circles. And so if you can get somebody like Anthony to kind of like ask good, hard hitting questions, maybe for the first time in, in a Mormon's life that kind of gets them out of this circular logic cycle and says, wait, 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 are you sure? <laughs> so what did you think about, what did you think about that? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That, that's totally fascinating. Um, uh, you know, because the truth is, the truth is, I mean, there's so much that, that he does that we see this again, just he asks them how, how sure they are about their beliefs. He kind of teases apart what their main, the main foundations of their beliefs are. And then for each one, he's like, well, if you took, if you took feelings away, you know, where would that leave you? And that always leads to fascinating conversations to the point where, you know, they're both saying like, oh, no, if I had evidence, that wouldn't be as good as if I had feelings. I need feelings. Wasn't yeah, that fascinating? Didn't he ask that? Was it that or the missionaries where he asked, is that superior? Is it superior to believe something? And they're like, oh, no, feelings? beliefs are way superior than evidence. Yeah. And I think that's interesting. And I did. He, didn't he just ask because you can never discuss you can never discover that the faith isn't true. It's almost like with with feelings, you can never be in a position to discover that there's actually might be holes in what you've based your entire I don't life quite on. I understand that because you could have feelings telling you that it's wrong or untrue, right? But they're in a place where their feelings but make, also, 
because she didn't say feeling. She said that I have a sure knowledge over and over again. And that's kind of what we are just primed in Mormonism to do, that it's almost not even faith. It's a sure knowledge that you know with every fiber of your being. Like that's the kind of language Mormons use. And so if you go off of feelings and you find that superior to evidence, you are kind of in a position to never discover if it's true. So yeah. that's why you'll hear people ask, you know, in the spaces that we're in, like, if I could tell if I had something that would prove the church wasn't true or if the church wasn't true, would you want to know? Sometimes people will be 50 50. Sometimes they'll be like, I don't want to see your evidence because feelings are superior. You know what I mean? That's a really powerful place for someone to get. And I've, I've heard of people's faith crises and not that, that that's the goal of any of this, but I've heard people say it was someone asking me whether or not I would want to know if it wasn't true. Like Cody and, and Leah Young, that's what comes to mind. And realizing that that the answer in their head was, no, I wouldn't want to know. That being the trigger for them saying, well, then I must not be looking at this objectively, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where it's like the preference would be feelings over evidence, but would you recommend that same method for coming to truth to somebody else? Would you recommend that? And I think um, that the way that Anthony asked those questions, the couple had some like really interesting answers on that. But if you notice, again, the circular logic where Jenny is like only she said only if I experimented and had the fruits to show. But that kind of is already admitting that you are likely conditioned to cherry pick what you see as good evidence, because she was quite honest, saying, like, I could also just say if I wasn't religious, I would just say that the good fruits of me living a good life, I would just chalk up to living in America and being a blessed person. Right. Do you Remember that part? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting and very truthful of her. And then. um, and again, like going back to the superiority of feelings over evidence, I, while I do identify as an atheist, I don't want people to get the wrong impression that I am anti-religion. I understand the importance that spiritual things that can't always be explained um, have that are impactful in the society that we build and life is hard and people need some beautiful spiritual promptings and things that help them um, through hard times. So I definitely get that. But with that being said, I this isn't necessarily a street epistemology type question, but it does beg the question that if you were in a trial falsely accused of something, would you prefer the jury to go off of evidence or feelings? Or feelings? Yeah. When yeah. push comes to shove, if something is very serious on the line, you go to prison if or you go free. Or if your kid's going to die of cancer, yeah. it, do you want your doctor going on, you know, nature you know, journal of a medical major medical association. Do you want the treatment decisions based on science or on your doctor's, you know, feelings? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, that kind of also leads into the bigger thing of a lot of the reasons that Mormon stories of what we do, what we do, because there are families being torn apart by Mormonism. There are families being torn apart by things that are founded in bad evidence that are founded, not in um, good empathy for people on different beliefs, LGBT identifying type people, different, you know, gender identities, different sexual orientations, so many different things. Um, Beliefs about race. It, about it, yeah. The role like of women. have real life effects about what people feel that are, that their spiritual confirmations have real life effects. So when people say, leave the church, leave it alone, all of those things, I wish we could, if people's, you know, spiritual promptings didn't lead them to tear families apart or all these different things that we want to minimize as much as possible. So like we were going back with the trial and the evidence, having spiritual feelings that get you through hard times is a beautiful thing. But if it's harming people and if it has negative real world effects, we want to dig a little bit deeper and make sure that we're founding our beliefs and as much evidence as possible. So that's personally, and I can't speak for John or Mormon stories generally, that's personally what I find really appealing about street epistemology is just have people second guess maybe um, if their beliefs after everything is said and done are founded in evidence and empathy. So, yeah, we talk a lot about informed consent on Mormon stories. And the truth is the church has been around long enough. The Mormon church has been around long enough to realize that, that they're basically indoctrinating people to think that feelings are facts or evidence. And that almost deserves its own level of informed consent where you would sit a youth, a child or a youth, or even a, a investigator down and say, listen, we, 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 be, we have as our epistemological foundation, this idea that feelings are evidence and that, you know, other people may say that evidence should be evidence, not feelings. And that feelings aren't a solid ground. That's where we stand. 
but but we should disclose through informed consent that that's our bias and that that's what we're doing yeah. here. We are trying to elicit a feeling in you so that then we could associate that feeling with the prompting that that therefore means that what you are experiencing now is true. That approach probably deserves its own level of informed consent, I, yeah. I think. Yeah. Especially yeah. when you're dealing with children and you're teaching children. If you feel it, that means it's true. Well, I like it that they always come back to what about Muslims and the Quran? Like what religion doesn't do that? And we should probably add in our show notes that classic video that we include on Mormon Stories podcast where we've got yeah. 10 or 20 different people of different faiths all bearing their testimony. And it's, guess what? Spoiler alert. It's always based on feelings and it always sounds almost identical, whether you're Jewish or Muslim or fundamentalist Mormon or whatever, evangelical. Yeah. Yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses, it's really interesting because I mean, there's another book called like outsider test for faith. I think that I read kind of during my faith deconstruction type process and you start to become a little bit more humble in your beliefs and just shrug your shoulders. And sometimes, I mean, I don't want everything to lead to nihilism necessarily, no, but uh -uh. sometimes it turns into like, you have to be honest that, um, as a Mormon, I was, I thought my beliefs were special. I thought, you know, yes, this method is unreliable technically, but for me, since it's true, it's fine. But you know that you wouldn't necessarily, um, advise someone else to use that method. But for me, it's special for me. I make it work. Um, cause you want it, not only do you want it to work, your whole life depends on you making it work by you having a special pleading that your system for coming to the truth that this is the right God, the right book, the right religion. You need it to be true because so much of your life revolves around Mormonism. It's a high demand religion by definition. So 10% um, of your income for life to your yeah. mission service, like eternal marriage, like yeah. career choices, uh, education choices, number yeah. of kid choices. There's just so much at stake. We're not... We're not about on Mormon stories, tearing people's faith apart per se, or taking people out of the church. And even more importantly, street epistemology isn't about that either. It's really about, I mean, helping people be more thoughtful about what they base their life on um, and having them, you know, just, just be more clear and intentional. Yeah. And, and by the way, you talked about kind of uh, epistemic humility. That's something we really yeah. get into uh, when we talk to Anthony, I think in part three, we talk about epistemic humility and uh, that, that'll be something you guys can look out for. Yep. And it's, you know, it plays at this logical fallacy of special pleading that I always think is really interesting. It kind of makes sure that we scratch that we don't have special pleading. Religious people don't have special pleading that we get to have special rules for our method of coming to truth and that everything should kind of, when all things are even that we are applying the same logic all the way across the board. You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, I, what, what else, another thing what I loved, another thing I loved when he got her to repeat back the position he, he was he, taking, he felt like he was being misunderstood in his question. So he's like, what do you think my question is? And then she repeats yeah. it back. That is a, if you can get the person you're engaging this conversation with, like you said in the last episode to steel man, to represent your argument, that's a, that shows that you're both operating in good faith. You're listening to each other and that you're engaged and I, I was commenting to you off off screen just by the end of this show how engaged Jenny and Anthony right. were. They were really thinking. They were really processing. And that's for me. This I, this is a really really good example of street epistemology when it's working mm -hmm. because they're thinking about their faith. They're debating back and forth. They're they even want to be honest. I don't think I don't yeah. think Mormon Anthony or necessarily missionaries were in a position where they wanted to be super honest and forthcoming with what they actually believe. But I think Jenny was very, very reflective. And but she that's wanted more to advanced. Give, I mean, yeah, I think Jenny did a fabulous job of being super honest um, and not just trying to put forward what she thinks that the church would want her to say. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think that she was really, really honest in making sure that she had as much reflection as possible to actually dig a little bit deeper and engage in this exercise. Whereas the, I think the other three, the two missionaries and Mormon Anthony weren't as quite committed to the exercise. They were more committed to preaching, which is, I don't know, maybe that's another male patriarchal thing to do. I have no idea. Yeah. Another thing I loved, I loved it when Anthony Magdabosco made the point when he asked the question, is it possible that the fact that you two were told that the Mormon church was true from the beginning, sort of being primed that way. Is it possible that that has influenced yeah. the conclusions that you've arrived at in your mind emotionally? 
Well, I mean, that's that that is such a powerful question that we probably don't think about or acknowledge enough. Yeah, because he said that like if somebody handed me the Book of Mormon a couple of years ago, because he's a right. convert, by the way. So he good. This, he's like, yeah. I would have used it as fire, but I needed to have an emotional conviction first. And if you perked up, and he's, he's like, like, Oh, is, really? Tell me more. Yeah. But is that <laughs> let's explore that? Uh, is that a good method to go to go about things? It's almost like at one time you kind of were a critical thinker. What was it that made you decide to turn off your critical thinking? Yeah. And I mean, we know it's it's pretty factual when you say, John, that missionaries, they kind of um, are usually seeking out people that are in positions that would be questioning the meaning of life. Maybe they lost somebody close to them, vulnerable, financial hard times. They're looking for an emotional reason to convert to the church. Very few people, I think, you know, are converted for like super high intellectual reasons where everything just makes sense and everything aligns, all the dominoes, all the puzzle pieces fit. And then they have a spiritual confirmation later. It's it's usually some, you know, uh, more of emotional reason. Maybe it's horniness, too. Maybe it's just somebody who... Uh, Looking for a... Yeah, I mean, how many... <laughs> there's a lot of... People who convert because they're romantic, dating a Mormon or Romantic something. conversions. I mean, that's one of the top reasons people join Mormons. I agree, yeah. yeah, yeah. In, in the modern era. I loved it when they were talking about... Uh, are, is, is, a, is a position based on feeling... I mean, I'm kind of being repetitive here, but but towards the end, they were getting to this kind of nugget of are, are positions based on feelings more virtuous or more legitimate than positions based on facts or evidence? Mm-hmm. And and I lo- again, I loved it that they were just, oh, it's all about the feelings. And, and it's so circular because then there's always this doctrine that, that Mormons will often come to, Karen, I'm sure you've seen this a lot where the Mormons will say, well, that's the plan of salvation from the beginning. Heavenly Father had to build a veil of forgiveness. Heavenly Father had to make it a test. And so it has to be about feelings because if Heavenly Father were to have given us the evidence, then we would have no reason to believe. And isn't that convenient that it it has to be built into the, quote, plan of salvation, that there isn't evidence because there clearly isn't. And so yes. clearly it, it has to have been designed that way from the start. Yeah. But, yeah. Know. And if you notice, I can't remember if I, I, I spliced this part out or if it was actually in what we just watched where Anthony make Mormon, Anthony makes the point that the purpose of life is to go through trials. And again, all of that is based on, on a foundation of your God belief. And so without right. epistemology right. to dig it, well, how do you know that? Right. How do you know that? There has to be a God to have God's plan of salvation, salvation, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so that's where you get into this tricky situation where your interlocutor will want to tell you why their belief is so great. But it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We want to move back and say, how do you even know that this belief is so great? What is it based on? And again, you'll just kind of come back to the circular logic of uh, testing, testing the fruits, seeing the fruits, but being very um, having a strong confirmation bias and wanting to see what you want to see. And so sorry um, to throw my own parents under the bus a little bit, but my mom is a huge believer in by your fruits, you shall know them. And when I bring up things about what about the fruits of polygamy? What about the fruits of like their racist doctrines? What about the fruits of that? Those are very conveniently ignored. And the fruits that Mormons want to see, which I do believe there are plenty of good fruits. I am not a Mormon hater the way that I think I get accused of being. I actually love a lot of, yes, there's a lot of, um, I had a beautiful Christ-centered home, you could say, in my marriage. My marriage was stronger um, because of the way that I practice Mormonism, you could say. And I believe there are a lot of people in the same way. So you can cherry pick all over the board what you want to cherry pick. But the point I'm trying to make here is just by, be very, very careful um, when you are engaging with somebody an interlocutor for them to use like the fruits argument because you you can get into a really nasty territory really quickly by going down the lane of like well let's talk about those fruits i would just i just want to like caution people to stay away from those that would be getting into debate territory about the merits of the belief system and we we don't even want to engage in that yet we just want to talk about um if they can sustain and um i guess uh, have a strong foundation to believe that in the first place. Does that make sense? So. Yeah, totally. Kara, there's a couple of comments or questions that I wanted to kind of read out, sure. have you respond, and then maybe I can respond as well. Is that okay? Yeah. So Tim Moore writes, I really love street epistemology. I don't know how effective it is on Mormons because they're taught that what they don't know shouldn't negate what they do know and they fall back on that. What would you say to Tim? Anything come to mind? I don't mean to put you on the spot. Um. Yeah, that's a great, great point and a great comment. 
the only thing that comes to mind is just like with anybody else, um, you can ask about the testability, falsifiability. Um, you can still just uh, peel back the onion layers. And if it's not good with Mormons, then that's fine too. At least you ask the questions. That's what comes to mind. Yeah, and I think Anthony would say, okay, well, let's go to what you do know then and and let's analyze the foundations of that. I'm exactly. That would be For the sure. move that he would take. All right, Ryan, Kara, Ryan writes, Ryan Wimmer, I tried the method on a Christian who believed there's evidence for Jesus's resurrection, that if he didn't already believe in the resurrection, if he would have found the alleged evidence persuasive. He answered yes, but he did pause to think about it. When we parted, I asked him to think deeper about that question. Any thoughts on Ryan's approach with the Christian? I need to read it again because I didn't understand it, but you can go first. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I guess you would have to believe that there was a God and that Jesus okay. was the son of God before it's even worth talking about the resurrection. I think this goes back to what you said and what Anthony tries to say, getting into the weeds of specific religious or doctrinal beliefs kind of is, is beside the point of street epistemology. As soon as you're starting to talk about certain doctrinal tenets, you're probably off off topic. If you're trying to engage in street epistemology, you would say, well, for Jesus to be the son of God, there's got to be a God. And what's your, what's the basis of your belief in God? You wouldn't yeah. be. I think that's about 50% of it. I think, I think that's a fine question. Um, what Ryan posted there um, to get at the root of what this person, um, what this person's highest priority, highest value is, whether it's literal evidence or if he already based his belief in Jesus on a feeling and was looking for like confirmatory evidence still words out on if confirmatory is a word or not. So, um, <laughs> jury's out still on that one. So. I'm sure one of our viewers or listeners will tell us, do you know how hard it is to talk for a living and just be like, I hope this makes sense anyway. Um, the but I think that's a great question to ask and feeling sorry for us. Yeah. And we get picked on sometimes. <laughs> no, but the great thing about SE is that you can just literally ask a question and then end the conversation and try to make another appointment and, um, see how that question has sat with the person throughout the week and then pick up the conversation where you left off. So that's what's great about what Anthony does is he hands out these little puzzle pieces and he says, you know, come back and you make a complete set if we can get like three conversations <laughs> because you can only do so much one at a time. But um, yeah, I, I still think that's a great question. It show it gets to the root of why somebody believes that and what their value is. I like this point. Jonathan Anderson writes, it's a good, uh, you know, what, closing comment, not, not that we're exactly closing, but Jonathan Anderson writes, if a thing is true, it should welcome investigation and questioning um, and quest questing and questioning truth will win out. I like that. Is it Jay Rubin Clark who said, if, if we have the truth, it, it will, uh, it, it cannot be harmed. If we have not the it truth, should, it, should it should be, be harmed. harmed. Yeah. That's, I think that's kind of a, a really, a really true believing Mormon should view it that way, that they have nothing to fear and that they're, they're Can we the put that on the billboard? of their beliefs. That'd yeah, be that, that is, that is good. All right. If there's a donor out there that wants to support a billboard brought to you by CES letter and Mormon stories, we'll help you make that happen. Yeah. As <laughs> I, as an ex Mormon, even as a Mormon, I would have agreed with that statement. It was said by a Mormon leader. I think that's a fabulous way to go about things. I think like BYU and you know, it's, an accredited university that has studies and scientists and research would follow the scientific method and would want to have investigation put to all of different claims, including religious claims. So I think that Mormons at their core, um, they do want investigation. They do want people to poke and prod and they want to um, seek truth wherever it's found. I do believe that that is a, a value that I hold today that I got from Mormonism, to be honest. Cindy writes, wow, this could help us negotiate better with others. I'm hooked now. Let's see. Well, you know, let, let's just address what our viewers and listeners are going to get for the rest of the week. Sure. This is Street Epistemology slash Anthony Magna Bosco week on Mormon Stories. We're going to have five days in a row of Street Epistemology and uh, Anthony Magna Bosco. We brought him here a couple of weeks ago for Thrive. And for those who didn't join us at the beginning, Tuesday, tomorrow is going to be Anthony's story. 
where he goes in for a couple hours. He was surprised at the level of depth. You remember? It's so cute because he's like not obviously like a regular Mormon story his listener. And John's like asking him about his childhood. And he's like, no, they asked me this stuff before. We're like, welcome to Mormon stories. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, is anybody going to care about my, but I think it'll probably be the most in-depth interview he ever does I know, it's, it's in really his good. life. I love it. Yeah. And he tries to redirect me and I, I'm like a dog. We're not talking, like a... We're, we literally, I like ask <laughs> questions about Essie and John's like, wait for tomorrow. We want to know about this guy's story first. It's cute. <laughs> Yeah, I was worried that I upset you a little bit because no. I'm like, Carrie, you're going too fast. I want to hear a story. Anyway. No, because I say in the interview tomorrow that it's like when, especially a couple years ago, maybe like a year ago when I was really into all of Anthony's videos and stuff, you, it's what you want to know. You want to know who is this guy? Where did he come from? What's his religious background? How did he get started in this? You're like, what does his family think? How does somebody just pick this up as a hobby? Do you make money from it? Just answering all of the questions that you won't get anywhere else. So that'll be tomorrow's interview. That's day two. And then day three, Wednesday is going to be Anthony kind of giving an overview of what street epistemology is. We wanted to show you today so that you would care enough to watch, to learn about his story and then have the context to then understand us talking about street right. epistemology on Wednesday, which is part three. And you want to talk about part four again, just really quickly, our favorite, probably our favorite. <laughs> yeah, part four is really interesting. I I don't want to kind of give away. We shouldn't give away too, too much. much about it. Yeah. I want you to watch and see because I. It's epic. It's, it's kind of epic. like for, Muhammad Ali, George Foreman. It does Foreman not go the way exactly level. that you think it's going to go. It's it's super surprising. I've never seen anything like it. Let's just put it that way. Because on Mormon Stories, one of the early videos I ever did on Mormon Stories was with Sean McCraney. Mm -hmm. I, we we uh, brought him to Logan, sat him down, and he's been an, an ex-Mormon evangelical preacher for decades. He hosted the uh, Midnight Mormons debate with RFM, Just if a couple anyone's weeks familiar ago. with that. But, but he had a show, a TV show called Heart of the Matter that turned into a YouTube channel and he's been doing this as long as I have, if not longer, of just scrutinizing Mormonism, but from a super believing preacher, pastor, evangelical Christian standpoint. I actually, I met him in the hallway when he came in and I almost cried. He's actually a little bit of a hero of mine just because I remember watching him when I was like 15 or 16 in my parents' house in Provo when he was on his you know, his TV show that was like a public access kind of TV show that he hosted, Heart of the Matter, thinking, who is this guy saying all this crazy anti-Mormon stuff about Mormonism? And then, you know, you grow up and it was a lot of it was true, right? And so it was the first person that I ever, uh, ever knew had some truth about Mormonism that had ever been kept from me that I saw on TV. And you're typical, you do the kind of the typical Mormon thing where you're like, this guy's crazy. And then you were like, actually, he had some good points there. So it was really fun that I got to meet John. Yeah, and it, we literally, like, the day of or the day before, we had the idea of bringing him on. Because we were, again, we were trying to figure out if we were going to take Anthony to do street epistemology. Like, should we do it on Temple Square? Should we go to BYU? Like, and and we just didn't have the time. And so, like, we had this aha moment of, like, let's bring on, let's call Sean McCraney, you know. It was so cool. I asked a couple <laughs> other people. Um, to come on some other Mormon YouTubers right. and things. Yeah. And, um, they weren't super keen. <laughs> they weren't super keen, even though, um, you know, people, people of all different backgrounds really respect street epistemology and what Anthony does. But Sean was a good sport. He literally, we got, we called him the morning of and he hopped it's on epic. over. It was yeah. awesome. But that is going to be, I don't want to kind of give away um, what happens in that interview. It's, it's great. very exactly. interesting. Very, yeah. very interesting. And um. Yeah. Okay. What else? And then part five uh, Friday will be Kara and I role playing as believing Mormon parents, where we put Anthony Magnabosco in the difficult role of being a Mormon who had recently lost his faith. Because let's be frank, the main why are we showing you all of this? It's unlikely that most of you, although we it, we should talk about this, some of you may want to be the Anthony Magnaboscos of Mormonism here in Utah or wherever you live, because we yes. do want to encourage people to do record uh, street epistemology conversations with believing Mormons. And we're even willing to coach you on that, mentor you through a Discord channel that we're going to share a link with. And then if you do high quality or high enough quality audio or video, high enough quality, effective enough street epistemology conversations with Mormons, we will invite you and or repost your videos and conversations on the Mormon Stories channel. Is that right? Yes. And furthermore, Street Epistemology International is the nonprofit that Anthony runs with a few other awesome people. And you will hear in his interview talking about how they have actually 
got funding to give people camera equipment, audio equipment, train them to go out and be able to practice this technique because th what they want to do is be able to have data on, does this change minds? What does it do long-term mentally to people? This needs to actually be studied. And so that's kind of what um, the, the Street Epistemology International does. And so if you're actually really interested in this technique, please click the links that'll be in the show notes and get more information on this and get plugged in with the different SE communities. They're really fascinating and engaging and super helpful. And are, are you still thinking about doing Street I am, Epistemology, I am woman on the street? so busy. I was, I <laughs> what, literally what told Anthony. With? How are you busy? <laughs> What My boss is a real slave driver. <laughs> uh, no, John's lens was a delight. But we have so many projects here. I would love to find the time to be able to do that out on the street. People might be like, I know her. She works for Mormon Stories. But other no, than that. No, she's new on so. I've seen her on TikTok is what they're going to say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I literally told Anthony that if John never offered me a job here and this never happened, I would literally be trying to run a YouTube channel similar to his yeah. um, because I really believe in it and I love it so much. So it's definitely a passion of mine. So we'll see what 2022 brings. So if you feel called to be the Anthony Magdabosco of Mormonism, reach out to us and we want to support you and showcase your work. Uh, but the reason why I brought that all up is because the, the most common use case scenario that I think I envisioned as we were thinking right. about bringing Anthony on is that so many of you are going through a faith crisis or have been through a faith crisis and you're going to need to talk to your parents or your siblings or your bishop or your loved ones. I would love for street epistemology to be used in that way. And so yeah. we role play believing Mormons put Anthony on Friday in the difficult spot of representing a questioning or non-believing Mormon. And that's day five. And that's how we wrap up. And man, if any of you end up having meetings with your bishops or stake presidents or family members, Please and, reach out. and yeah, we would love to help you. Even if you want to record those conversations, even we'll consider as long as it's not illegal and it doesn't violate someone's, um, privacy or confidentiality. We don't, we don't want to dox people. Yeah. We would even be willing to share you guys attempting street epistemology with believing loved ones, because I think that might be the, the way this is used most. Yeah. And, and Anthony's really interested in that use case scenario. Yeah. That's right? kind of the things I was talking about with what they want to study of how it can be applied to different situations. Yeah. Um, because talking to a stranger is vastly different than talking to somebody you have a connected long-term relationship with that you're going to see again, you know? Um, and so what I find really interesting about the role play that we're going to get into in part five is how many times have you ever seen an hour long discussion between somebody who just lost their faith talking to their believing parents? I don't think that video exists on the internet. So what we did is we kind of role played it of what it might sound like. And it's almost like you're going to be a fly on a wall. I know we're role playing. I think we did a really good we job. Tried not to be too I hard studied I actually studied up for like what to say. I had to go back and like write down a script for myself of like how to believe. During, we were like having, we were having lunch at an Italian restaurant and Kara's like I had listening, my laptop listening up to and things like, and taking notes. We were so notes. busy that week. It was like two days before Thrive. I had no time, but I was like, I want to be the best believing Mormon that I can be. I want to actually represent what my mom would say in this conversation, you know? So how many times are you going to have a conversation with like that? So it's going to be yeah. interesting. It's going to be me and John pretending to be Mormons. Not that hard, but... Yeah, we have some experience at that. Yeah, it's fun. Anyway, super quick shout out. We got a super chat just now. Kara, if you'll show that. Um, we really appreciate uh, Diamond Dave uh, nice. sent us 100 bucks through the super chat feature here on YouTube. We really appreciate uh, whatever people donate to uh, our YouTube channel through super chat or just directly through uh, mormonstories.org or the Open Woo. Stories Foundation because your dona donations, let's just to be frank, they pay for Kara. They pay for me, they pay for Gerardo, they pay for our equipment. So thank you for donating. Whenever you join us live, you can also, um, do you know Facebook has an equivalent feature called stars where you can, you can, uh, you can click on the stars what? and it sends us some financial support as well. So oh. you can donate through Facebook using stars or YouTube using super chat, or you can just go to mormonstories.org and click on the donate button. But thank you. Was it Diamond Dave? Thank you for the super chat. Thanks to all of you who support us. And we talk in our next four episodes with Anthony about how we can help Anthony. He said that if he can only raise 40 grand, he can finish this incredibly important curriculum of training that he wants to offer people. So we want to help Anthony fundraise too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So make sure to find all of the links and see where you can donate. 
All right. So that's part one. Good job, Kara. I think Boom. that was really valuable. And we hope you enjoyed Anthony. Well, an illustration of Anthony using street epistemology with four Mormons. And now we hope you've got that background to appreciate the rest of street epistemology slash Anthony Magna Bosco week on Mormon stories podcast. Are you guys pumped? I'm so pumped. And Kara, Five th episodes. This wouldn't have happened without you, Kara, because I've wanted to interview him for a long time, but you have almost like an intellectual romance with Anthony Magna Bosco in all the appropriate ways. <laughs> and this wouldn't happen without you. So thank you for letting it happen. Yeah. Thanks for letting me. I literally first day at Mormon stories, I busted in the door and I was like, how can we get Anthony over here? <laughs> yeah. I was like, cause they've been planning this pre COVID and Anthony had to cancel his trip. So I was like, it's gonna happen. So you've so. met you've met Anthony Magna Bosco and Bill Real. Who's left? Uh Sam Harris. Sam Harris. Okay, and we'll work done. on that. We'll work on that. All right. All right, everyone. Well, we hope thank you, Kara. You're awesome. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. And please tune back. Are we doing it at 11 a.m. mountain time over the next four days? Is that, Does that the sound time? good to you? Let's do it at eleven. Okay. Yeah. So all of you, if you want to join us for the live stream. Actually, it might already be scheduled for tomorrow. Scheduled okay, for well, tomorrow, check out YouTube. It'll be pre-scheduled, <laughs> but we'll do it around 10 or 11 Mountain Time over the next four days. And that's how we're doing the live streams. We'd love you to join us. Thanks to everyone who commented today on YouTube and on Facebook. And again, thanks for the donations and the super chats. They help make this all possible. And thanks to Anthony for coming to Utah, speaking at Thrive, and for what his great work, because I think it's a important puzzle piece or an important tool in your tool belt to help you with believing family and friends and people you meet. Yeah. And just thank you Mormon stories listeners for going on this. I just, I have faith in you that you are looking for something a little bit different and maybe um, something out of the normal Mormon truth claims that we've already done. So thank you for going on this kind of intellectual truth claims of the foundations of why we believe things and the psychology behind it. So just thanks for going on this journey with us. I hope that you'll be excited to go on this ride because I know I am. So it's going to be five days of an investment, but I think you will come out the other side um, having grown in your brain and it'll be really fun. So thanks for joining us. All right, everyone, you guys take care. We'll see you guys all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Bye, everybody. Bye.